Here we are, My Muscle Project. Welcome back to another episode. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, there's actually more Asian than there is white at this uh, at this table now, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. So we're gonna do it in Mandarin. Today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you speak any Mandarin? Not at all. Yeah, me neither. No bueno. But it seems like it's a it's a more and more important skill as as time goes on. Can you speak any other languages? No, I tried to learn Spanish uh, many years ago because yeah. I because I heard that was the easiest one to start to master if you know English. Yeah, it'd be the first easy transition. So I tried that. Yeah, I was doing all the tapes and stuff. Oh yeah, and I learned how to ask for where the bathroom is. Okay, but I've forgotten. <laughs> Important for a bodybuilder, <laughs> drink a lot of water and shit. Yeah, it's like carrying around huge water. Yeah. Um, but this voice is uh, Eugene Eugene Teo, um, and he's well as we sort of decided over coffee. There's not necessarily uh, uh, like an exact name for what you do, mm. um, but I'll kind of distill it down for you guys. So uh, I participated very briefly in one of your, your seminars um, and, and Raf, you did pretty much most of the day, I would say. Uh, and what you do is you don't target anyone necessarily. You appeal a lot to bodybuilders, it seems like. As you mentioned, mm. they're probably a lot at your, uh, at your seminars, the majority mm. um, of the people there. But what you are is you're you're putting out content that's attracting people that want to go a bit deeper, that are looking mm. for more answers mm. because the traditional academic path of uh, mechanics and uh, how muscles work and how joints integrate and all that sort of stuff is um, not really working for these people. They're probably, um, you know, in pain or mm. maybe, um, you know, not seeing the results they want from a physique standpoint mm -hmm. um, and they're looking for new answers. And as well, you're also appealing to uh, our side of the coin as well, which is like kind of more movement, crossfitters, mm. uh, performance-based athletes who uh, maybe don't care as much about how they look, but definitely want to improve function and mobility and get out of pain and that sort of thing. So tell me where I, where I missed some, some gaps there. Pretty close. Okay. Not too bad. Not okay. too bad. Not too bad if somebody came in halfway through a haircut. <laughs> That's how I am. Um, you know, I've got to pull you guys up on, on on the show that you guys... I said to you guys, come down for both days. And, and you decided to come but come just on the day two. And the story I tell... This is, like any, this, is, this is any performance or any kind of um, live thing or anything that you do is um, I tell people, hey, my events or maybe most events anyway, and most things you'll do, when you first go to it, I liken it to a haircut. Or to open heart surgery. Mm. Now, if you walk in halfway through open heart surgery, what does it look like? It's going to be a disaster. It, it's it's a fucking mess. Yeah, it looks we don't like know where we're at. It's, it's yeah, murder. Yeah. It's yeah. complete murder. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it does look like murder. <laughs> you, you, yeah. walk, you walk in halfway through a haircut, it looks like, what the fuck's going on right now? Why is your half your head shaved right now? Yeah. Um, same kind of, it's, it's a mess. Especially when you've got that smock on, and you look like ugly as fuck. It's like, yeah, shit. Yeah. yeah. I actually worked out um, what it is about when you go to get your hair cut why you always look so ugly when you have the smock on. Okay. Like, you guys know that. It's not just me, right? I mean, not me, but yeah, sure, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, you do ugly, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, it's because the, 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 the mirror is straight in front of you. Okay. All right. And you always want to be side on to a mirror? Not side on, but when I was in, in the States teaching, the barber shop there, they had their mirrors on a downward angle. Uh, and even though I had the smock on, I was like, you know what? I don't look that fucking ugly right now. Yeah, I thought yeah, I, yeah. I look pretty good. Yeah, and then yeah. I started thinking, how do girls take their selfies? This is like, this is genius. They've known about this. I know. I don't know if they get their tits in the photo. Well, well, there's that. I mean, that's why I look good in the smock as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly right. Yeah, the tits. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, that was it. So yeah. that was mind boggling for me, but let's just not digress too far. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for someone who came in halfway through a haircut where the hair was half shaved or someone who came in halfway through where there was like murder on the operating table, pretty good. Not too bad. Nice. Um, I first started out as a, as a bodybuilder. I was, I tell everyone, that's where I first started out. Like that's all I wanted to do. Like not, I didn't care about bodybuilding competition when I was young because mm -hmm. I didn't know what that was. But I always cared about or looking good. In general, I wanted to, because I was a small person, I wanted to try to build a bigger frame. What did you start at? Like size-wise, yeah, yeah. body weight, I would have been at the same height. I remember when I was like in year nine or 10 at high school, I was doing rowing. I was about 50 kilos, same height. Mm. Um, so you can just throw that mic in a little bit closer. Oh, you, you want to get to midfield. There we go. There we yeah. go. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Cool. You're good. Are you doing yeah. like real rowing or do they delegate you like me to the, uh, to the front? Of the oh, I did both. Yeah, I was coxing and I was, um, and I was rowing. I pretended that I was wrong, but I was really coxy. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. No, that's that's the exact story Raph tells. Yeah, I was in the road team. Yeah, I was hard yeah. training and shit. Yeah, it was no, hardcore. I was just sitting there and just, yeah. Um, 
But no, like I had a lot, I had some structural issues back then as well, like developmental of okay. um of a bone structure. Um, like what? Uh, there's a thing called pectus excavatum. You may not sounds like exactly like what you've got excavated pec. Well, that's what it actually looks like. Like you got shot in the pec and you got this sunken. My cousin chest. has that. Yeah. Like you got, he's like you can put like yeah, a yeah, little, yeah. little apple in there or in something. In the but in the pool, yeah, yeah. You, there's like yeah, you yeah. got a pool there. Yeah. Um. So I always thought, hey, if I train more, I'll be able to fill that in with muscle mass. Okay. It doesn't really work like that, unfortunately. But that was my 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 thought process. Um. So I always cared about like, the aesthetic side of it, and then sure. eventually I got exposed to bodybuilding around maybe 2009 when I was maybe about 18 or so. I started thinking about oh bodybuilding. Okay. And that was interesting for me. So I started getting heavily into I want to compete I want to grow I want to change my body so all my training for a long time was all about how do I get as big as possible how do I get as lean as possible how do I also put it together in a way that was in my eyes very aesthetically appealing like you guys know like you guys aren't bodybuilders but you guys know when a physique just looks right yeah I watch the Olympia every year yeah yeah, yeah you know, like, this one just looks good it may mm. not be the biggest sort of leanest it could just be a CrossFit athlete like you know what they just have a really nice frame mm. Whereas someone else, mm. they could be shredded, they could be massive, but they look just fucking ugly. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and you know, the fact is you can actually engineer that. That, that. that is there for a reason. You really believe believe that they can, you can alter, not like hip width or anything, right? The pelvis. Not, not the fixed. actual bone. Right. But you can alter a lot about the... The way the, it flows. The flow. Right. The dimensions. Little things like the ratios of... I call these the accents in bodybuilding of delts and calves. If you have those two points, most of everything else will look a lot better. That's why... No, thankfully for me, without as much size as I used to have, by f- having those two areas, I look a lot more impressive than than I would if I didn't have those areas. Mm. Um, what calves? You know what? I'm not even sure what it is about it, about it, but it seems to complete and cap off the physique. Yeah, um, where it just looks right to have those two accents more than anything else. It does look fucked up when you have no calves. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Savage, man. Yeah. Fuck, savage. Straight in. <laughs> yeah, straight straight in. after me, bro. I'm sitting right here, man. <laughs> Just because my legs are under the desk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you said it, not me, CrossFitter. Fuck. Yeah. They got baby cows over here just fucking talking about how calves are important yeah. and shit. <laughs> but, um, but that was what I was um, always about. Like, I, sure. I believe you could engineer because I, I would see that in, um, in, in a lot of the way the old school would train. Right. Through the 50s, 60s, 70s, where those guys were training was trying to develop these um this aesthetic flow the v taper like the way that arnold schwarzenegger would talk about if i add a kilo here got to put on a little bit here or whatever to keep my dimensions it's not just about putting on indiscriminate mass it's about having flow to that size Mm. because i knew for myself i'm never going to be the biggest because i'm a small asian man i'm never going to be the leanest because i don't want to suffer that hard Mm. um but I could always control my presentation on stage in terms of how I posed and also um, the flow of my physique mm. in terms of the structure, not the bones, but the actual, the muscle bellies um, and the development of them. So that's where all I, everything I cared about came from. And then I started to see a lot of parallels between that kind of training or what I was doing there, what I was trying to achieve with that and a lot of other modalities because I didn't train um, bodybuilders like as a personal trainer when I was working in gyms because there weren't that many around. Yeah. Um, and I was working in a general population gym. But I found that the techniques that I would use to say, um, to help to bring out my delts as a bodybuilder with less emphasis on the traps, which would take away from my dimensions um, as a smaller person, that same technique would help my general population stay-at-home mum get a lot less pain and tension in her neck. Right. You know? And she didn't care about bodybuilding, but yeah. that was a relevant skill for her to have. Mm. And I found that was kind of cool. And I found a lot of the same kind of parallels in with with things like, okay, biceps training. That's probably the most bodybuilder thing you could ever come across. Sure. Is biceps. Yeah, yeah. If you like crossfitters, who needs who needs biceps? Or powerlifters, who needs biceps? Um, but then I started realizing how much of an important role the biceps were playing for elbow stability for for powerlifters on the bench press mm. particularly on the eccentric how important the um the biceps were for throwers in terms of the like when they're throwing on the eccentric for like a pitcher or a cricketer mm. that brachioradialis would play to stabilize the elbow joint to prevent a lot of extra um forces to smash up the tendons there okay. and that would be part of how it would help those athletes get stronger and, and rehabilitate their injuries not that i was a rehab guy but I thought, hey i'm a bodybuilder you got no muscle mass in there let's try to grow that shit mm. that was my focus and that's where i started spinning off more and more and then part of me as well is i started to it's first again first started out in bodybuilding where i wanted to build muscle mass in certain areas for my physique 
and I realized not all bodybuilders had these muscles that I wanted, like the mid-back or like maybe the lower lats or, or the calves, for example, you know? Um, like you look at most bodybuilders, most of them don't have calves. Mm. So why the hell would I want to train like a bodybuilder mm. to get calves? Of course. So then I would say, who has the biggest calves across all populations of all their athletes? And it was ballet, it was dancers. Mm. So I started studying what they would do. I started looking towards... It's interesting. Rhythm- yeah, yeah. I, used to, I used to look towards rhythmic gymnastics yeah. for posing advice. Okay. Like, you know, in the, in the Olympics, they got the ribbons and the, yeah, and the yeah, rings yeah. and shit. Yeah. Um, I loved watching that because of the way they would flow, the way they would move and how um, little accents, like when they were hitting a lunging pose, they wouldn't be up on the ball of their foot. They would rest the whole back of their foot onto the ground. So it would just create one mm. sweeping line, like little tiny things that you wouldn't pick up on, but so many bodybuilders missed out on. Mm. And that was from their presentation standpoint. But again, like I started doing calf training, not the way bodybuilders do, but the way ballet da- dancers do, the way dancers mm. do. I started trying to train my, my erectors, my mid back, the way that Olympic lifters would, with a lot of snatch, a lot of clean and jerk, a lot of high pulls. Mm. Because all Olympic lifters, well, not all, but most of them, they've got the big back boobs, like the mid-back. Massive. You know, you look at Lu Zhao, you want to do an overhead squat, you just see, okay, all I'm seeing right now is your rhomboids bursting out of your back. Mm. I want that. And mm. I think that overhead squat does that. Mm. Um, or crossfitters, handstands mid-back, just these pipes running mm. up and down from the base of their neck down to, their sp- down to the base of their spine. So, a lot of delts in CrossFitters as well. Exactly yeah. right as well because of a lot of the, the ring work. A lot of pressing. The multi-plane yeah. ring. Thrusters, shit like that. Yeah, yeah. a lot of stability mm. um, that I was getting from gymnastics and CrossFit work. Like, this, is, this is fascinating to me because I was trying to bodybuild still. That was all I, I cared about, but it wasn't working. Like just doing the typical bodybuilding method wasn't enough. So I realized that I've got to start to diversify. And then the more I analyzed it, the old school guys through the 50s, through the 70s, they were diversifying. Mm. Like back then, training wasn't cool. If you were a guy and you mm. were going to the gym, you were a fag. Yeah. And, and that was derogatory. Yeah, like, yeah, like, hey, yeah. you were gay. I remember those days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it wasn't the cool thing to do. So everybody who trained or had any kind of idea about fitness were all shunned into these uh, little YMCA's mm. or these underground basement kind That's of gyms. I started as well, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah YMCA, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so it's the bo- unbelievable, yeah, how much it has changed. Yeah. Well, it has changed. Like, yeah, yeah. And it's such a short amount of time. Yeah. But bodybuilders would train alongside Olympic lifters, would train alongside weightlifters, train alongside gymnasts, and they'd all date, date the ballet dancers. <laughs> they all learn from each other. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's what people um, didn't necessarily, that's what people have lost these days, where this is like, where CrossFit or where bodybuilders, where it's all segregation. Yeah, yeah. There's all this separation of different modalities where we've got to understand that we are more the same than we are different. We're like, all still we're, humans. We're all, we're yeah. all humans, we're all people. We're all going to respond to the same inputs and we all want to be better humans. And the more that we can do that, the more we'll be able to um, expand upon whatever we want to then focus on like bodybuilding or CrossFit or weightlifting or swimming or archery or whatever it is that you want to do. You need to be, first of all, a proficient human. Mm. Or as, as You have to build as good a base as um, you possibly can. That will come from diversifying. But people don't even necessarily notice that where like uh, a guy like Arnold Schwarzenegger... Um, all the guys back then had different training partners. Like, not just, like, people think of Arnold and Franco as a classic combo. Right. They would only train chest together. Arnold would then go train legs with Ed Corny. Right. would go train arms with someone else, mm. with Robbie Robinson. Mm. Because they knew how to say, okay, Franco, you've got a great chest. I want to train chest with you. But you've got shitty legs. I'm going to go train legs with Ed Corny because he's mm. got good legs. He knows about legs. He knows yeah. about legs. Yeah, oh, yeah, I want to go train for Robbie Robinson. He's, he's the Black Prince. He's got these incredible arms. I'm going to go work with him for arms. I'm going to mm. leave you alone. Mm. There was always that mentality of learning from everybody, even in the same sport, but us from many alt- other disciplines. But with a focus on the physique. Because well, for them, it was the focus. The ultimate yeah, yeah. focus was the physique. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the, the main premise was they're trying to find not just the one answer, but they're trying to get an answer from one place mm. and then they're going to another place for another answer. Mm. And then it comes down to Arnie or whoever it is mm. to amalgamate that. And that's what I try to do for people. Mm. That's what I see. Um, I'm not a bodybuilder. I don't attract bodybuilders anymore. I'm not a, a weightlifter or a powerlifter or anything like that or a dancer. I'm just someone who likes to learn about how to develop the body the best, as best as possible mm. and how to amalgamate that into one thing. Mm. I, wouldn't need, I don't even want to call it a system. 
mm. or necessarily a method, but a way to say, okay, you're coming to me with this problem. What tool can I use mm. from what modality or from what person? Where should you go mm. to help to develop that? Yeah, I was, I was thinking like, because uh, obviously you, you had a few case studies running through the seminar and I just kind of got an idea of a few of them and I chatted to a few people and they were like, yeah, you know, he worked on this with this person and that person mm. had this thing. And I was sort of curious as to like, you know, we get stuck in the bias of, uh, you know, something that's probably really common that you probably get a lot is lower back pain, right? Mm. Someone that's, that's done something that their back most likely deadlifting or doing some way too much of one thing. And I was, I was sort of thinking to myself, you know, how would I fix back pain? You know, I, I'll probably do this, probably do that, but it's probably like one or two ways that have kind of really worked in the past. And like, we have some sessions with our coaches and meetings where we talk about injury prevention and that sort of thing. And then the way you approached it was very systematic, like kind of like peeling back the layers and going one piece at a time. Have you found that this, the method that you use to kind of get towards that back pain um, mm. is like very reliable or do you always find that you're going to need something different every single time with each person? Do you ever change up the system? Has right. the system evolved or is it kind of working how it is now? Mm. There always is going to be some kind of degree of context or individuality based on why they come to you or, or what the issue is. But my start point for most people is always the, s the same system to say, let's just start with here with these key landmarks um, that are probably dysfunctional in that lower back or upper back, or whatever, the, whatever the issue is. Let's start there and we'll only go more complex when we need to. So like take the, con the context of lower back. It could be so many things. It could be immediately to say, okay, you've got um, like really, really tight hip flexors and they're pulling through onto your lower back, cranking you into this anterior tilt, it's mm -hmm. jacking up your rectus and that's a very common thing. Okay, let's, it, maybe it's a stretch thing. That will be the most simple thing. Let's, go, let's do some soft tissue massage, mash and bash on that tissue and you'll see how you feel. Now, if that doesn't work, then I'll say, let's go a layer deeper. Now, I used to teach that initially but then I found that didn't work. Mm. So I would go the, the layer deeper, which was, hey, hang on, why is that tissue tight in the first place? Why is that hip flexor so tight? Now, the common thing would be, oh, it's because we sit so much. Mm. Like right now, I'm in hip flexion, okay? So you're screwing yourself up. That's why we, we're more sedentary. That's why hip flexors are so tight. It's like, no, well, that's, not, that's, not, that's not all that they are. They're probably tight for a reason. They're probably tight because they sense some kind of danger or weakness in the body, or they're not aware because of, because of sedentary lifestyle, we don't use hip flexors enough through their active ranges or through their full articulations. And because of that, we've lost strength in there and awareness of the muscle. So that's where I'll then say, maybe it's not about smash and bash. Maybe it's more about wake up, activate, train, or tighten in a sense in inverted commas. Um, and I found, so that was my left layer. So I would do that and that would work tremendously because doing some very, very simple, basic um, hip flexor work, some pike pulses, um, that would be enough to send some kind of active stimulus to the brain and from the brain down to the to the muscle saying, hey, here's your muscle, start using it. Mm. And that would be enough to cause a shift where your brain says, hey, I've, I know what the hip flexor is now. I know that it's got some strength to stabilize the pelvis, mm -hmm. to work as a muscle around the pelvis. So now I'm going to now allow you to open up some range of motion. So it will naturally, organically dissipate in its tension. And then that lower back pain may start to resolve itself. Mm. If it still doesn't, which happens to, to a lot of people, then it's like, okay, now we've got to go a layer deeper. What other muscles are around there? And that's where you say, okay, maybe it's glutes, maybe it's erectus, mm. maybe it's abs, maybe it's hamstrings. And you go to each one methodically. I normally start with the breath and diaphragm and then I'll go into the hip flexors because they're the two areas people are completely overlooking mm. when it comes to global dysfunction mm. for the breath and then for hip flexors because no one trains them. People just avoid that stuff. And it's probably probably something I'll say, you know what? If we never touch that, let's start touching that. Let's mm. start training that and see what happens. Mm. But then like that's only two layers. That's breath, that's hip flexor stretch, that's hip flexor training, and then other muscles. What if that low back pain is psychosomatic, is perceptual? That was my next question. Yeah. Because if you... Yeah, actually, you wouldn't have heard me talking about, as much about it, but because um, that, that was at the start of the haircut, not halfway through. <laughs> <laughs> but when we're looking at um, at pain, not all, but a big part of pain is perception. Mm. A huge part of it is is perceptual based, where pain is separate from nociception or from actual tissue damage or tissue trauma or tissue stimulation. 
you can have pain without any kind of actual um, damage to tissue. And vice versa. And vice versa. Yeah. The exact opposite as well, where there can be damage with completely no yeah. pain at all. Yeah. Um, there's a ton, like I'm not the research guy, but there is a ton of research out there showing um Chances are we all have a degree of just screwed up tissues of damage of nerve on nerve, bone on bone, blah, 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 but no dysfunction, no pain, no nothing. Mm. And it's like, okay. And then there'll be other people who are seemingly healthy, but are in chronic pains. And there are other people who in research settings, you can create and stimulate pain or you can completely change and alter um, like rashes, tissue damage, swelling, all these actual physiological effects in the body you can stimulate that without with, but just by simply changing the perception hmm. not actually inducing anything in terms of damage to the body hmm. and that's huge like you probably would have heard of the, like the rubber hand illusion yeah yeah like we you can have you ever had it done to yourself before no what no well, pretty much, you put your this will have to be a, visu, a, vi, a visual thing, but you have your your hand on a table and it's behind. A, a veil, right? And then there's another hand. It's a, it's a rubber hand right there that you can see. So you can't see your actual hand, you're, you're, but the rubber hand is right here. Yeah. yeah. But you can't see it. And then the person, so you would be stroking this hand very suggestively and you'd lick your lips and wink at me <laughs> whilst you are also stroking this hand. Yeah. And after about a minute or so, I'll start to be able to feel this hand because I can't see that one. Yeah. Make sense? Then, so I... Because I'm, I'm getting the right input. My brain says, oh, I'm being touched because I feel the sensation and I can see myself being touched. That is now my hand. And then you can go and get a hammer and smash onto the, the fake hand. The fake hand. Yeah. And the participant, I will scream out in pain. <laughs> You're a sick fuck. <laughs> You're laughing at my pain. <laughs> you just hurt me. But that's incredible. Yeah. There's literally no, mm. like you're not touching me whatsoever, yeah. but that can be enough to induce significant amounts of pain. Mm. And it takes a moment for your body to then rea realize, oh, hang on, no, that's, that, wasn't, that wasn't me. But huge. Mm. There's, there's, a, there's a whole, whole bunch of these different, um, uh, different uh, I guess, research models or whatever that are out there with respect to pain that I find really interesting. There's another one called the, um, the, Pinocchio, the, the Pinocchio Illusion. And so you need, a, again, you need a buddy for it, but it's like where you would stand in front of me, Raf, and you would stand behind me. Mm. Now, I would start to stroke <laughs> your nose yes. <laughs> at the same time as you're behind me stroking my nose okay. at the exact same interval. And the <laughs> then slowly, uh, like, pants come off? Yeah, <laughs> and then, no. But, but my, uh, my eyes are closed as I'm doing it. Okay. <laughs> so I am getting the sensation of my nose being touched mm. whilst I'm touching... A nose yep. Yep. away from me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it is so, so, so compelling that when you first go to turn around, you feel like you've got this giant nose. You're worried about really? knocking it into things. Wow. The Pinocchio effect. That's amazing. These are all like a whole bunch of different experiments or head fucks that were put out by this um, a research from Adelaide, Laura Mosley, who's like at the pine, he's at the cutting edge of, um, of pain research and, and trying to understand pain mm. from a chronic or rehabilitatory setting. Mm. Um, and, but yeah, like that's the whole other layer to pain. And then we've got to understand, hey, if pain is so perceptual, that's really important because so many people identify as I have lower back pain. I am the lower back pain person now. That's part of their, that's their memory. That's who they are. Or they've been told by a physio, you've herniated a disc or you've yeah, slipped yeah. this disc. It's out of your spine it's now. It's really bad. It's bad. You can't tie your shoelaces ever again. Mm. And like, oh, fuck. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. That's why I'm hurting now. Mm. And it fits into the model. Mm. Your brain is like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Never bend over ever again. Mm. And then your perception becomes your reality. And it's not crazy to think of it that way. That is what is actually playing out in the body. So, it's, it's a multifaceted thing. Lower back pain is not just, hey, tight hip flexors or hey, weak hip flexors or hey, weak glutes. Maybe it's also partly to do with the perception that's completely influenced by your own personal bias, everything you've had as a contextual thing from day one. Mm. Every person you've spoken to, every doctor, every Netflix thing you've seen, whatever, about lower back pain or has built up in your mind this construct of what pain really is or what it should be for you. And that could lead you to have pain. Mm. And that's why, like, I see what I do as being, or this whole um, understanding pain 
phenomenon as being so important because people need to start rethinking that because we've been taught, we've been fed this model for so many years of tissue damage or of slip discs or of herniations or whatever it is as being always the cause of the issue. And, and that makes perfect sense. But then we don't realize that a lot of that diagnostic can also be um, screwing up a lot of people and it can also be disarming them. It can be making them feel completely um, disempowered mm. on their ability to then help fix their own pain and fix their own bodies mm. because a, a big part of it could be perceptual where like, hey, if you hurt your back years ago, probably if, it's, if you haven't done anything stupid since then, the damage should be repaired mm. for the most part. Mm. You should no longer be in pain for years upon years upon. Of course, there's going to be exceptions. Like I shouldn't say that as a blanket rule, but there will be, um, for the most part, there'll be repair in the body. Um, so why are you still in pain? Mm. Because of the memory, because of the perception, because you were told by very, very good authority figures who, have, who are well-intentioned as well. They're not trying to hurt you, mm. but they've told you, hey, you've got this big issue. You're never going to be able to do this ever again. You can't train again. You can't do this, whatever. You're, gonna, you're just destined to be fucked up. Mm. And... And that's, that's what people need to start really considering. Mm. Now, somebody comes to me day one and says, hey, I got lower back pain. I don't go straight there. <laughs> like yeah. it's, that's, that's not what yeah, I yeah, do. Of course, I, yeah. I don't want to say, hey, have you heard about the rubber hand illusion? <laughs> come here, come into my room. Thank you. Yeah, let me, <laughs> close your eyes. Let me rub your nose. Um, <laughs> no, like, <laughs> Imagine first day we've got a lot of back pain. Oi, so come into this room. <laughs> we've got a rubber hand <laughs> and all the lights are off. <laughs> so I knew this Eugene guy was fucked up. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, but, you know, always with the client, I'll tell them to start with what makes sense. Start with, like, with what makes logical sense and then show the crazy when you need to. Yeah. Go that layer deeper when you need to. And then how long will that take? That could be a five minute thing or it could be a, a five hour thing or it could be a five day thing mm. in terms of unpeeling the layers of the onion yeah. it really depends on um, on yeah on, on the person itself mm. um, which is which is what I, what I I try to get people thinking about like yeah. people come to be saying hey what's your system I say my system is to, is to always go a layer deeper yeah. let's start with stretching I did that it didn't work let's go to soft tissue it didn't work let's go to training it worked mm. great stop there what if it didn't work Mm. Let's go train something else. Didn't work. Let's go to the next layer. Mm. And then eventually it may be, okay, let's go to start to look to um, the way that you perceive pain. Mm. And then how do you really alter that for somebody? That is really challenging. Mm. Like that is hard because um, that's where you may need to be start slowly overcoming years of their bias, years of what they've been told by their doctor or their friend or their reality or their, their memories um, that they've created in their mind, somehow you've got to go in there and have them rethink it. Somehow you've got to be able to tell them and give them the confidence of, oh no, that's not me anymore. How do you do that? And that's where I see um, a big, big, big importance in in not just knowledge, but not just science, but application of it. How do you use tools like humor to disarm somebody? Hmm. How do you use stories and anecdotes to help somebody bring down their guard so you can go in there and start helping them hmm. and start giving them um, a better idea as to how to start rethinking their pain. Like one thing you may notice a lot through, um, through a lot of my teaching is I do tell a lot of stories or I do try to use um, a lot of humor in what I do. I mean, one thing it's, that, is, that is who I am as a personality and that's probably why like, I've been able to do what I do um, organically, the way that I, that I run my work. Um, but I, um, I came to realize, or a, f a friend started telling me this just literally just yesterday, that that's actually a really clever way to go about helping people understand their bodies better. Mm. Because the biggest part of learning a new skill, learning a new muscle activation, learning about your pain, learning about anything, the first step isn't how well you can learn it, it's about how well you can forget your current biases. Mm. How well can you forget what you currently know and completely let yourself go to be impressionable to the new information. That forgetting thing is what people struggle with the most. And humor, stories, whatever, the casual nature, that can be a huge, huge part for coaches or for anybody who wants to take care of their lives and take charge of their lives or the thirds around them is so important as a tool. Mm. And then you can come in with the facts, with the data, with the applications. And that's where you can start creating this, um, this whole system or this whole method of helping people to help themselves. Mm. You know, that's why you will never ever have the complete understanding of the human body if you just go with 
the research or just go with the facts, mm. the content. I mean, that's always going to be necessary. And I think we need to understand all about the science and mm. the actual facts of how the human body actually works. But that's only going to take you so far. Mm. Application is the next part of it. And forgetting mm. how to influence people, how to talk to people and get them understanding their bodies and their selves better is huge. Mm. And that's what I try. Like, I'm nowhere near skilled enough to be able to do that with people. Like, that's not my, my jam at all. Um, I wish it was because I want to be able to have that as a skill set because I think it's so powerful and it's still missing. But I at least want to be able to get people thinking about that as, hey, it's not just about your training. It's not just about your diet. It's not just about your stretching or your, or your muscle, muscle body work or whatever it is. It's also about um, your own personal paradigm in your, in your brain, your own, your own perception. And you need to understand that for you to become something else, that's something else being a pain-free person mm. or that's something else being a successful business person or whatever it is, you have to completely change everything about yourself. Mm. If you really want to make significant change, it's not just external. It's not just going to be about your, your, your back no longer be broken. It's also going to be about you no longer identifying as that person. And that's a big one that people poo-poo a lot because it sounds very, very esoteric and like, ah, eh, yes, it's all for the birds. It's all this meditation and kumbaya, hakuna matata stuff. It's like, no, it's, there is a way to legitimize that. And that is a part that's the whole mind-body connection that people are overlooking because mm. it's not substantiated in the science yeah. per se. But hey, prove me wrong. Yeah, it's very easy for scientists to um, hit back very hard because science has done so much. It's almost like, because it's the yardstick, if you don't go yardstick for yardstick, it's like, it's very easy to lose that that conversation because, you know, sure. we created these drugs and did this thing there. That, um, that story you, that you sort of uh, mentioned um Yesterday at the seminar, I think you were talking about uh, some, some previous pain or had or whatever, but it made me start thinking about the knee pain journey that we went on. And uh, we suffered a lot f from really bad knee pain for like two years, both of us. Mm -hmm. And um, it was it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was shared, shared suffering, yeah, yeah, <laughs> shared yeah. suffering. And like we, we, our pain defined us so much that it completely altered how I live my life in terms of what I thought I could do, like, you know, I couldn't run to the shops anymore. Right. I couldn't, I didn't want to play that sport. I didn't want to try that thing because my knees hurt too much. And like, oh, I'm not going to sit down like that anymore. I'm not going to walk upstairs like that anymore. I'm going to change my gait to the point that even now, what, three years on since we've had serious knee issues is like, there are still old habits that I've had mm -hmm. that I pick up now only because I'm hyper aware because, you know, we do this stuff for a living mm -hmm. that I'm like, wow, you know, if I wasn't hyper aware of this stuff, I was just the everyday person that, didn't really think much about training. I, I could, you know, there's no way I could fix this. Like it would be so ingrained in me that it completely changes who you are, right? To the point where, you know, I know that, okay, now my knees are better. I've done more on them. Like, yeah, I can squat this weight or I can move it in this direction to a point. But some people might think, oh, I don't do that anymore. I don't mm. squat like that. I don't put my knee past my toe anymore. Like I don't go on my toes and, and put my bums down on my heels. And that makes, that leads to a whole host of other issues. And it's exactly what you're saying, yeah. right? It's like now it is so hard to change. And now you're coming to this person that moves in like four planes of motion mm -hmm. like a robot and they're getting all sorts of other issues that all stem from that early thing because they didn't fix it properly. Well, I yeah. always felt like when our knees were bad, I couldn't even watch people do things that would hurt my knee. Mm. Like if I watched For sure. someone squat on their toes, I was like, man, I can't watch this. It's like sure. my knees. But you should be able to, right? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah same thing. Like the heaps of movements now, I think I can do that I just don't really do. Mm. Because it used to hurt my knees. Yeah. Sure. Like yeah. That, that's big for a lot of people because, you know, like there's also, I mean, in your case, Raph, maybe things like, like mirror neurons in the brain. Like, like monkey see, monkey do. Like when you watch someone doing an action, your brain is playing out that rehearsal in its brain. And that could be enough to say, to set off the pain, the pain tag in your knee. So it actually is something that can be measurable, that can be um, assessed. It's like, okay, that's why you're having your pain. But then, yeah, a big part of it is how do we get you from not being able to watch somebody score of knees past their toes to be able to doing that eventually. You know, and that's that's what people gotta start thinking about. And that, that is that's program design, honestly. That mm. is thinking about like program design in their life to how to coax somebody from one end of the spectrum where they can't literally watch somebody bend their knee to being able to do a jumping bent knee squat or whatever it is down the road. And how do you piece them across? How do you pull them along that that continuum? Mm. Um, and that's that's you know, our jobs as people, like whether you're a teacher or not, or educator, but, or a coach, that's what we should be trying to do with, 
with our selves, with our life or whatever. And the same thing, like, hey, it's not even pain. Let's say it's business. Like right now you're here, you're in a dead-end job, you're a personal trainer and you want to be this entrepreneur living the life on a beach in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> How do you get there? You've got to Selling find, <laughs> sell, well, yeah, it's, it's drug dealing. Yeah. yeah. It's like, <laughs> but how do you get there? You know, it starts with the first connection, right? Yeah. You got to, how do you find that first, the first, the first, the first deal? Yeah. The first middleman, maybe the, the street walker. How do you go from there? And then and what do you then, cut it with? Like, what's the cheapest product? Economies of scale, exactly right? right? Exactly right. Exactly. How do you cut it? Like, where do you, where do you get your first, like, your, your first bathtub, you know, mixing table? Yeah. <laughs> bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Where do you buy the, where, where do you find cheap bathtubs? <laughs> But <laughs> it's building up across layers. You don't just go straight there straight away. You don't go and become Dominican Republic. Even if you were a drug lord, you wouldn't get that overnight. Yeah. There's got to be some kind of transformation and some kind of probably guide, some kind of probably um, blueprint for you to follow to get there. Mm. Same thing with pain. Same thing with training. If you want to get to a 200 kilo squat and you're doing 100 kilos right now, you've got to roadmap it. You've got mm. to put it out there. Um, people... Like I like to talk in those lenses because people understand that's what we do. Like we're in the gym, we understand. Oh, progressive overload. Everything in life is progressive overload, mm. and not just load, but progressive overloading yourself. Yeah, for sure. Pushing that envelope until you get to the point where you need VAs. But that's another conversation that we're yeah. going gonna to bring up with Eugene. But um, going back to your own training, right? You said mm. uh, you, you actually missed this conversation in the car. You actually had extra 15 kilos of muscle tissue on him at one stage, right? So, um, I don't know if you... Am I going to get his name wrong? Ben, Ben someone. He's a former, like, big-time bodybuilder. I think his best place was, like, six at the Olympia. Pekulski? Uh, Pekulski, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the white guy with the bald head. Yeah, yeah. Um... Really interesting, right? I heard I heard something about him uh, where obviously he was he was world class. So he was on the mm. Olympia stage, mm. right? And now he's actually uh, yeah, he's like twenty five, thirty kilos lighter, probably more, mm. and he's cut it way way back. And someone was giving him a lot of credit as to like you know you were known for your body. That is what impressed people the most. You know that is something that you kind of built your identity upon, and so. To and you know a lot, a lot of these full time bodybuilders get a lot of you know, like health issues long term right down the track and obviously now he's become you know very health aware and he's trying to look after himself more and he's you know obviously stripped back a lot of muscle and um, whoever it was I can't remember was giving him a lot of credit as to like you know, that would have been a hard thing to do to be known as one of the baddest dudes on the planet in terms of how you look and then to lose that whole thing you know he's obviously still tries to stay in shape but to kind of pull that all back and, and, and change so much from, you know, Ben Pakulski, the bodybuilder, the world-class uh, Olympic athlete to, Olympian, sorry, to now an educator, a teacher, that sort of thing. And it reminds me a lot of your path. So mm. I guess my question is, how did your sort of original identity as the bodybuilder, as the physique guy, then change over time to, to lose 15 kilos of mass? Because I mean, for those of you who aren't aware, like that shit is, when you're coming up, every kilo is like gold, right? It's like... Mm. It's like it's like buying a property. Like you, you've invested in that. You've put the time in. If you've worked mm. on it, it's special to you. It means a lot. Like, and then to just have it all go so quickly, it you know it requires a lot of um, you know you got to be flexible with your ego in a sense, right? So how did you deal with that, and how did that evolve over time? It's um, it's a I guess it's in a simple answer. It's a reframing process. So for what most of us see, especially bodybuilding, it's so external. I was like, okay, you've lost 15 kilos. When I saw you last, you were so much bigger. You mm. were filling out these t-shirts. Now, oh, you're just a, like a regular guy or whatever. They see the external and say, you've lost all this. My first question is, hey, if I lost that so quickly, what do you think I gained in, in, in reaction to it, in response to that? So for me to be able to, um, to lose those 15 kilos, what were they holding me back from being able to do? What came, like you just said it, for me to be able to put on that kind of size, it took a lot of hard hours of training, eating, prepping, meticulous, mm. everything, sleep, sleep. Yeah. every single thing was um, T's crossed and I's dotted for a long, long time. Now, what if I was to redirect that energy to spreading something else of my message or what I want to do with helping people and teaching and business, whatever you want to call it? I've, you can gain a lot. Mm. Like 15 kilos, that's a lot of muscle. 15 kilos equivalent in terms of educating, traveling, teaching, expanding, content creation, researching, whatever you want to call it, that's a lot as well. Yeah. And that's, what, that's why it was so easy for me to do it. Like I don't look back at like, of course, if I could snap my finger and say I got muscle back, I would love that. Mm. It'd be cool. Like it's from the external. If I could have it without having to put the internal aside. Um, but for me, that's not what I wanted. 
like at that point, I'd just finished competing and I'd done very, very well in that competition. And, and it was not just about the external, hey, you came, you know, I think it was second, or, I came third in this competition. I looked really fantastic. It was more about, it was a very successful prep very, very healthy, very, very easy, very, very smooth. I could maintain a lot of my life while going through it and it was a lot of fun for me. Um, so I'd achieved a lot of the boxes that I wanted to in terms of trying to find out that that key or that puzzle to bodybuilding and now I was like, okay, you've done that. Now what else do you want to learn about? What else do you want to do? What else do you want to, um, to work towards? And at that point in time, a lot of opportunities started arising with, um, with working with different athletes, with, uh, with teaching, with content creation, with exploring new different pathways of, of business and things like that. So it was very, very easy for me to say, hey, I want to, oh, this interests me more. Mm. And then those hours I put into bodybuilding, I happily would say, no, I would rather not eat right now because I'm right in the middle of reading this book. Mm. Or I'm right in the middle of this conversation or I need to, or I can't train now because I'd rather make sure I preserve my brain function so I can teach on the weekend or whatever it is. And that was so easy for me to do. And the 15 kilos coming off, I was like, whatever. Because I'm gaining all of this. I'm gaining the ability, not for muscle, but I'm gaining the ability to learn more about other areas of life with business, with growth, with personal development, with relationships, with, um, with my own just knowledge about the human body. That's what excited me. Like I, as much as I said at the start, I love to look good. What does looking good really mean? That's your own personal construct. Do I need to look the way that I looked 10 years ago or five years ago? No, I don't. I need to, need to look enough for me to be happy with myself. Mm. And that could be 20 kilos lighter again. I wouldn't necessarily be fussed with that. Uh, it's more about how self-aware you are, how much are you at peace or how much of what you do with your life is in alignment with what you really care about. And it's that mismatch that screws a lot of people up. Mm. It's where they still obsess about the muscle and they're trying to do the business or they're trying to do the relationship, they're trying to do the other stuff and they're still yawn after that muscle. They're always going to be unhappy. They're always going to be because they can't reframe that. Mm. The second they do, they will let go of the muscle and they won't miss it. They'll be like, eh, whatever. I've got all this now. Look at what I've made. Look at my family. Look at everything else I've been able to achieve in life. I'm so happy now. Mm. And then if they want to go back to the muscle, they'll be able to as well. I'll be able to do it and I'll probably be able to do it so much better mm. because most of us, when we first started out in the gym, it was for the wrong reason. Well, I mean, picking up chicks is a great reason, yeah. but yeah. Well, yeah, but where did that come from? It came from insecurity. Of course. Yeah, of course. It came from insecurity. It came from... Oh, I was skinny. I was skinny. very insecure. I had, I had a big shotgun hole in my chest or whatever. <laughs> it was all these, all these little things, so it, but it, at some point, it was insecurity mm. and I was trying to find a way to get validation. Mm. You're trying to seek validation from an external source, from the girls or from the, from the guys or whatever it may have been. You're trying to seek that. That's why we all started. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just human nature. Um, but eventually, people have got to come to the uh, realization that, hey, you will never get that external validation from anybody else. You're mm. always going to get it from yourself. It's got to be internal. Mm. So when you start internally validating yourself and internally being at peace with what you're doing, then you don't give a shit about how you look anymore. Mm. Yeah, it's so interesting. We ask this question or this question comes up in my head at the at the perfect moments and the last time this question came up for me it, it was uh someone that you probably know the glute guy Brett yeah Contreras. yeah yeah he uh he works with a lot of physique athletes obviously mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a lot of people who care way too much about how they look and mm -hmm. how others validate them and how many followers they have and mm -hmm. et cetera et cetera i would say you're to it's safe to say you're very much surrounded by people like that that mm -hmm. attend your seminars how do you feel about bodybuilding and not not bodybuilding um in terms of the the training methodology mm. but bodybuilding like the sport right stepping on stage um being judged and you know getting a medal and that sort of thing do you think having done it as, as well yourself do you think it has been um an, a negative thing for the industry overall like do you think if it disappeared and uh we didn't have it the industry would overall be better or um do you think it, it serves a purpose it is the devil's playground for narcissism. Yeah. <laughs> Body, simple as that. Um, if you can understand that going into it, then and arm yourself with the knowledge of that and knowledge of yourself and the fact that maybe you are a narcissist or have those tendencies and know to avoid it, mm. <laughs> then it should be fine. But people don't do that. Mm. People don't have that self-awareness. But that's just like any other sport as well. It's not just any, like I would say any, most sports can breed that kind of narcissism or um, it's all about me, it's all about the external validation, the achievements or whatever it is um, because it is putting you in the spotlight. Mm. Bodybuilding is a very easy target to look at because you are literally 
spending time to be judged and put up there on stage um, in front of other people and be told, like, hey, you don't look good enough. Um, so that it, it can bruise a lot of egos and it can hurt a lot of people. Um, I think there's good and bad parts to it, probably more bad. Mm. And I'll say more of the bad comes from the fact that people are misinformed when they go into it. They've got no idea what to expect. They don't have the right mentors in place telling them, hey, this is what bodybuilding actually really is. And this is the, the fact is, um, bodybuilding really is... I don't like to call it a sport because the way people treat it, it's not a sport. But in its essence, it should be seen as a sport. And if it's seen as a sport, we should understand that, hey, I'm never going to be a basketball player because of my structure, because of my genetics. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to be a good one. So why the hell would I spend all my life around trying to become a basketball player? That would be delusional. Yeah. You know, yeah, it, yeah. Would be, it would be completely delusional. Simple yeah. as that. You don't have that for bodybuilding. If, yeah. you, if you tell somebody you don't have the genetics for bodybuilding, you shouldn't be doing your delusional, you're a shit person. It's like, no, you're fat shaming. No, no, no. It's, it's all politically incorrect. No, no, no. I'm being what I'm saying, telling you, you don't have the potential to be up there at this higher level. So don't do it. Or do it, but make sure it doesn't take away from the rest of your life. Like, of course, if I want to, I can go play, go play basketball. I can go play with my friends on the weekend, a pickup game or whatever. I can go shoot hoops on the, just for fun. It's a hobby. Exactly. I can, I, I exactly can get you know we we, we can do we can do a tandem basketball game for sure that'd be fantastic, you know, um, of course power to you to do that so power to you go train in the gym power to you improve your looks power to you improve your physique, but there will come a point in time when where um, where you've got to realize that hey this sport at the upper echelon where you do make those real, real sacrifices and you are prone to a lot more of the narcissistic influences of judgment and your peers and the spotlight it's not for you mm. or it's not worth it mm. it would be completely worth it if you were being paid a million dollars if you were being millions of dollars if you had a lot riding on the line of you doing that but that is reserved for honestly a very small percentage of people with not just the right genetics but also the right personality what do you mean personality well you've got to be you have to be sellable Right. You go, like, I'm a Schwarzenegger. Right. Okay. You got to have the charisma as well. Right. It's not just about the way you move, the way you hold everything. yourself. Yeah. Everything. Everything there is so so important for any athletic endeavor. It's not just about uh, like like there's a reason why like we tend to tend to gravitate towards certain sports as well because of the people who are at the peaks of those sports and their personalities and the fun and the fun side of it as well mm. and that's what makes it so appealing. Um, but you know it's it's a tricky one. Mm. It's a tricky one. No. Yeah. I mean. I, I always see it as um, not as a sport, but the way you put it there, uh, I feel like is, is definitely fair. And what a lot of people don't realize is really high-level coaches could walk into a gym, whether they're well-trained or that's their first day, and be like, no chance, potential, mm -hmm. no chance, mm -hmm. potential. That as, as easily as picking height. Yep. Because they know muscle insertions, they yep. know hip to shoulder ratios, they know all these different lengths and stuff that are required to be a high level bodybuilder, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's what everyone wants to be in any sport, right? Everyone mm -hmm. wants to be the best when they're starting. Everyone wants to be, I want to be LeBron James. Yeah. You know? I want to be Ronnie Coleman, like all mm -hmm. this shit, right? But like you said, it's not there for bodybuilding, which is super interesting. So when you're in the seminar, right, and you, you come across these people, I'm sure I'm sure they attend your seminars and mm. stuff. Maybe not as much as mm. um, as much any, these days anymore. But is it a case of like, you know, you're just going to help this person how you can in that moment, and they just want what they want, or do you like having converse, deeper conversations with people about knowing what they're in for and knowing that it's narcissistic, mm. knowing mm. it's not the be all and end all, and that potentially exploring other things can be more exciting and more fulfilling. For sure. Like, it's never my place. I'm not a therapist and I'm not there to tell people what we're doing is wrong because I've got no idea on anything about these people. Even after having a two-hour chat with them, I still am only scratching the surface on who they really are as a person. It's not my place to say, hey, you're in it for the wrong reasons or you don't have a chance in this sport or whatever. <laughs> so that's not my place. Yeah. Um, I am there, especially in the seminar, to, to be there to, to help them do whatever they're currently doing better in terms of like I, I like a lot of the muscle mechanics workshops are all about how to get the body moving better how to get it feeling better how to get you a better person so if you want to be a bodybuilder go bodybuild if you want to go power go power if you want to go to crossfit go do crossfit and you'll be unencumbered with the pain you'll move better you'll develop muscle better you'll be stronger better and that's fine and then I do like to get people thinking more like I'm not going to tell them don't do something or do something but I like to try to at least provoke the thought 
for them to start reassessing or assessing what they currently do and say, is this really where I want where I want to be doing? Where, what what I'm be doing? Mm. Um, because people have got to, like I've never told anybody don't compete. I never come come to someone you're not ready. You shouldn't be doing this. You're doing it for the wrong reasons. Because who am I to ever judge that? Because hey, I was doing bodybuilding for the wrong reasons when I first started, and it was a very good thing for me, for mm. my journey. And I've got no idea where that person is on their journey. They've got to make their own mistakes. And if I come in there and I say to them, hey, you should be doing this. And they say, okay, I won't do it anymore because you told me to. I might feel good about myself for about five minutes. But how do I know that I didn't just derail that person from their biggest hmm. crucible of a journey of screwing themselves up with bodybuilding that would then make them completely realize the error of their ways if there was an error and then improving themselves beyond that. And then having that dark time of bodybuilding where it really ruined them or whatever it was mm. um, as a memory that would help fuel them to educate other people mm. in a positive light. You know, so yeah. I never ever try to push that on other people. I say, look, here's my story. Here's what I've done. Here's yeah. what I know for myself. Do what you want with it. Yeah. If it means you won't compete, fine. I hope it doesn't though. If it means that you were to go through something quite similar in that lens that it would then help you give you perspective. Mm. You know, people need those kinds of perspectives because People, at the end of the day, everything that I teach people comes from my own negative experiences. Yeah. But your failures. Those, the failures, yeah. but they were there for a reason. They were there to help give me a very, very strong memory and understanding of, okay, that is not what you want to do or it's not how the body should work. You've got to change this up. Mm. And that's why I can teach what I teach with such confidence because I literally have been there and seen the, the bad effects of whatever it was or the negatives to it. Now I can say for sure, this is what I know. This is what has, uh, has been shown for me. Um, do what you want with it. Mm. So, where does that leave you in terms of what you're trying to do with your own training? Obviously, you're trying mm. to, and we talked about a little bit, kind of explore some new stuff with the body mm. and that sort of thing. But, you know, training is probably very different for you now. You don't have a gym membership. You're mm. kind of like dropping in and out, just doing your thing. Like, what are you trying to do when you step into the gym or when you maybe, um, you know, look six months ahead? Is there is there a plan or is now just going day by day? Because, you know, bodybuilding for anyone who's really tried it, it is like, you could tell you what workout you're doing on a Monday at 6 p.m. in 12 months, right? Yeah. It's that structured to the point where you're living this life now where, you know, like you said, in the car, you've got one suitcase and yeah. it's country to country, it's time zone yeah. to time zone and it's just completely nomadic in a sense. Mm. So, what are you trying to do with your own training at the moment and why? Yeah. So, first of all, I would actually say like that rigidity to the bodybuilding lifestyle is probably not the ultimate way to train for bodybuilding. From what I know now, very controversial statement, but please continue. <laughs> yeah. Very, very interesting. Like the body part splits and knowing, okay, Monday's chest day, 6 p.m. I'm going to hit incline, then I'm going to hit this, I'm going to hit that with this amount of volume. I've got to hit 25 sets per week for my volume threshold or whatever it is to be able to grow. That's what the research says, That's yeah. That's what the research says. But all of that is for the birds when it comes down to um, all the different contexts that could be thrown at you. Let's say the research shows that I need to hit 20 sets to grow my chest. That research has got no idea at all about my genetics for chest growth. What about a guy like Raf, where he's got a missing pec major? Are the 20 sets that I do going to be the same for him? What's going to happen if he had a few nights poor sleep, a lot of extra stress or whatever? What if he ate differently? What if he was traveling through time zones or whatever it is? There are so many variables that will all impede or improve muscle growth potential. So most important is to have the body parts split or whatever there in the back of your mind as a tool and then know how to listen to your body day to day and then choose the right tool for the job in terms of the set, the exercise, the volume, the movements that you choose and learn how to explore and auto-regulate. Auto-regulation and this free approach, I guess, freaks out a lot of people because they get this anxiety, um, but what about my pressure structure and routine? Mm. No, you can. You should still have that. You should definitely have that as much as you can, but you also have to learn how to um, be completely adaptive. You've got to learn how to um, not have a set way and how to add in or how to, subtra how to subtract or how to combine. Um, and that's what's really been missing from bodybuilding for a very, very long time. And that's part of what's creating a lot of dysfunction. And that's just purely, purely from the way that we approach training. Not necessarily just the actual, like the way that we choose movements, the way that we combine things together um, and the whole body part splits as well. Whereas I, I do start to see a lot more merit now in not necessarily full body, um, but a lot of blended work. 
blending things together um, where you'd be combining body parts, combining movements, combining patterns mm. um, and looking beyond just the basic biomechanics. People have got to realize that um, when you train in the gym, you are not just training your muscles. Like we understand we train in the gym, you are training your muscles, you're also training connective tissue, you're also training your nervous system, you're not also training, you're stimulating your lymphatic system, you're stimulating your immune system, you're doing something to your digestive system, to your stress response system, to your adrenals, you're doing everything is being stimulated in some way. Your body is one unified, complete system and we focus just on the muscle or connective tissue or maybe the nervous system in terms of neural demands yep. of like, hey, you've got to get jacked up for this one rep max. That's about it. But we don't look to, um, to explore the other aspects um, that training, which is our sport, whether we're athletes or not, has to offer us. So the way that I approach training right now, again, this is my context being someone who is traveling a lot more and can't devote anywhere near as much time as I would potentially like to in the ideal scenario for training because mm-hmm. I train two days a week, maybe three days because weekends I teach, Monday I recover, Friday I'm preparing, Tuesday to Thursday is when I really have the time and, uh, and, the, des- and the real need to be able to train. Because I'd love to train on Friday. I love to train on the weekends, but I can't because I know it may start taking away from teaching and I love that mm. more at the moment. Mm. Um, but this will be useful for people to look at. When I walk into the gym, I say, okay, I do want to train my muscle. How? Because I, at the end of the day, I'm still a bodybuilder. I still want to build muscle. Yeah. So that's going to always be my, my major goal. How can I do as much of that without it taking away from the other systems? How, oh, so you're trying to avoid the other systems as much without, as possible. No, without it taking away, without it, right. without having detrimental effects. Right, because you need them for other stuff. Mm-hmm. So like you're correct, and stuff, correct. Right? Or how can I okay. stimulate all systems to give them all a little bit of a, a taste? Mm. So if we're stuck very, very much in rigid sagittal plane patterns, like most bodybuilders are, you're on the preacher curl, you're on the skull crusher, mm. you're on the close grip bench, you're on the squat, you're on the leg press. Hey, you're doing full body fantastic but you're in one plane you're training tissue you're training joints you're training cns for sure but maybe you're not training the coordinative aspect to your cns your cerebellum Mm. maybe you're not training the um the basal ganglia some of the the accuracy timing coordination aspect to um to movements Maybe because you're not moving in a multi-planar way with a lot more flow to your body, you're not opening up tissues, you're not restoring flow to your peripheral nerves or the lymphatic system. Mm. Maybe you're not breathing properly because you're clinching all the time, doing a lot of mouth breathing and grinding your teeth. So you're not getting enough diaphragmatic respiratory flow. Now there's going to be a lot more stagnation to your training. Mm. Well, hey, you're doing full body training, so you're fine. Mm -hmm. Well, there's layers to it. Mm. And that's where... um, one person may look at it and say, that's fucking confusing or that's too many different things you're trying to master. You're going to be the master of none. Um, but I'll look at it and say, I'm excited. Like that's what makes training exciting. Hmm. That's what makes it have no more rules. And that's what also makes you start to look towards some of the most robust and strongest athletes in the world being the gymnasts, being um, the acrobats. What are they doing? They're hitting all systems hmm. when they train. And if they were to add in a little bit of actual resistance work, hypertrophy stimulated kind of work from the research of 20 sets for chest, they'll blow up like mad and they do blow up like mad. But if you look to who look the strongest and most injury free um, athletes are, it's Cirque du Soleil performers. And they're so robust. And if you gave them the slightest stimulus to try to do a little bit more like actual hypertrophy work from the research, of course they're going to blow up. Mm up until a point where it takes away from the other systems. Mm. So I walk in on a day and say, okay, I'm at a base level. If everything was at level, I'll just try to get big. <laughs> I'll yeah. do a bodybuilding kind of research, 20 sets of chest or whatever, yeah. for sure. And I'll, I'll choose the body part or parts based on what I feel I need to fill in. Where do I need to cre- iron out the creases in my t-shirt or whatever it may be. <laughs> yeah. um, and But then I'll always be thinking about my mind, okay, I've spent an hour and a half doing a lot of sagittal plane chest pressing. What is that going to take away from over the next few days? Mm. What do we need to sprinkle in now as accessory, remedial, whatever work for the other systems? Mm. And that's how I start to adapt things. Mm. Um, 
and that's that, that could be one one way to that, I, that I look at things mm. um, that I found to be it's helped to preserve, it's helped to build, it's helped to maintain a lot of my strength and muscle mass. And that's if I had the ideal scenario now to train and do nothing else, that's how I would still train. Mm. That's how I would still try to build muscle mass. That's how I still would try to build strength. Mm. I'll still try to do all the exact same things, just more of it. Mm. Yeah, I think it's good because like eventually you reach a point where, like you said, just getting big or just training the muscles does get boring, right? It's why mm-hmm. people end up transitioning into, you know, maybe um, something you're a bit, a little bit different CrossFit mm-hmm. that's probably like the first thing that a lot yeah. of the bodybuilders jump to is they're like oh, okay I'm big I get it like but I need more out of my training like I need sure. some, I need something new I need to like kind of be not necessarily more functional is not always the way but they're just like you know maybe they were athletes and they're like mm. you know I kind of mm. miss the footy thing I kind of miss being on a team I kind of miss just kind of getting after it you know and so they explore other things and there's tons of other stuff out there but you see when they when they make that transition as well that generally um, when they go from that, everything is isolated. Everything mm-hmm. is just like, you know, you, you work in a very specific way and you tell that story about I love with the trap and the delt and how you isolate it, but we'll get to that later. And it's just like you see eventually the coordination aspect come together when they have to link double unders or they have to like mm-hmm. do a burpee and then into a box jump. They're very rigid at first and then eventually things smoothen out and they become more athletic and they move better. Mm. But then that reaches a point where it's like, okay, now we're doing way too much squatting. Now we're yeah. doing way too much pressing. Right? Now we're not doing enough horizontal pulling. And so if they're intelligent or if the gym's you know, got a good program, then that'll come full circle again. It'll start to look yes. a bit like your stuff, right? Yes. Where they're doing a bit more rehab stuff. They're doing a bit more rotational work, that sort mm. of thing. What do sports performance do? What do Olympians do? Oh, like they're doing med ball work. They're mm. doing, what do strong men do? Oh, they carry sandbags. Like yeah. why are they doing all these different things? It's because you need all these things, right? Exactly. The body, the body needs all this stimulus. Even me, just recently, um, I just love diving into worlds. I have no idea about, right? So recently, I started breakdancing. We'll talk about this more on the after show. But I basically got thrown into this world that has zero progression and structure, right? In terms of uh, strength, mm. right? So, for example, the instructor will be like, "Hey guys, today warm up or no warm up." The obvious thing in my mind is like you always fucking warm up, okay? Like someone's going to get injured here. And these are all just like people that work in the city and, um, you know, a, a lot of them, are, it's in the city. So, there's a lot of Asian people, mm. uh, a lot of Koreans, a lot of Japanese. Their arms like have never lifted more than their laptop bag. I'm telling you right now. And he's like, cool, we're going to warm up with freestanding handstands. And I'm like, my brain is like, holy shit. These guys don't even know how to hold front support, let alone, they don't even, they can't even hold themselves against a wall and there's like kick up and, he, and he's like grabbing their ankles and forcing them up and stuff. But what you, what you don't realize is this is what this guy did. This guy did this when he started and now this dude is freestanding handstand with his legs apart, spinning. And now he's going to one hand. And now it's back to two hands. Now it's one hand, back to two hands. And I go, man, what like kind of strength training did you do that? What progressions? Like, so he's like, I have no fucking idea. Like I just started doing this shit and I just was like watching this guy do it. And then he helped me and like, there's, there's no, there's like, I showed him like some basic drills. Like I showed him a whole hold and he's like, that's a good idea. He's like, yeah, it does help them. And they're like, oh, I do get it now with the back. Like in the, and I'm yeah, like, man, yeah. this is crazy. And what kind of made me realize is that the way you brought up to think that like, how the body works and how certain things work and it's the only way to do it, it's not always necessarily like the best way. And then having been thrown into that world in like the last six months, I'm like, there is definitely a bit of mystery out here where, you know, you were saying like where you run into those things, right? Where you saw the acrobat and he deadlifted like 260 kilos and you're like, this is really not what Mm -hmm. I thought it would be. Like this Mm -hmm. kind of breaks a lot of rules right here. And this is the same thing. This guy is doing flares, which is like, you know, when gymnasts get on the little mushroom thing and they, they, and they, they spin they their spin. feet around on the yeah, pommel yeah. horse, yeah. this dude's just doing it on the ground for just like 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. And then he like comes out of it and stands up and he goes, all right, you guys try. <laughs> I'm like, you don't <laughs> understand what level you're at right now. Like you are at one of the high, you are on the, the very tip of the spear right now in terms mm-hmm. of abilities and you just taught that whole thing to yourself. I'm like, fuck, do we really need to like stretch the hamstring for like, you know, 10 minutes and then do like these tiny pulses and movement or is there like is there a, a possibility that we can just kind of like throw ourselves in the fire and just kind of learn as we go and the body will adapt he's proving he's proving me wrong so probably like you know it's a bruce lee mentality of use no way as way there's always going to be many ways to go achieve it and as long as nothing snaps <laughs> hey because you could say hey if you don't warm up you're going to snap something if you just go and call to an overhead handstand hole you're going to you're going to break your neck yeah you could probably make sense out of that but if you did warm up, would that guarantee that you wouldn't break something? Mm. Definitely not. Mm. So like, hey, well, if there's 
are really not going to guarantee success or failure if you want to just go in cold. Jesus, take the wheel. Let's see what happens. Mm. You know, mm. um, why not? I'm I'm not averse to that mm. unless if it really does start to increase the risk significantly. Yeah, like I wouldn't go do a one rep max snatch cold. Yeah, probably. Yeah, but I'm sure someone would. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, we've seen it go both ways. We've seen it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Roy, who's um, one of our business partners, who's I don't know if he's here now, but um, yeah, he went through a phase where he truly he believed. Yeah, he truly believed he couldn't get injured. Like it was, it was as solid right. as like the sky is blue, you know. Right. And uh, he would he would walk in and snatch max weights like without any warm up, like just cold. And it worked for ages. He was like, I was, I can't believe it. he just did like a hundred kilos cold. Like he literally went downstairs, did a couple air squats, and was like, boom. And then like probably six months later, <laughs> he could barely get out of his chair. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it is. It is kind of interesting how you can kind of break a lot of rules for a long time, but then, you know, as we talked about, the coffee eventually does come back to bite you. So, I think that there are you can break rules for very short periods of time mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. you need to kind of set your foundations up for. And it's actually uh, one thing you mentioned in the seminar yesterday that I was curious about is I kind of looked left and right when you said it because I wasn't sure what people's reactions were. But you said once I get once you get something to a point, guys, you don't really have to do this thing anymore. I thought it was an interesting concept because. Um, if that is really the case, then you just saved people a shitload of time because we do a lot of of the same stuff over and over again because, you know, foundations, basics, you know, keep it solid. But you're saying if you get something to a certain point, now that it works, it's going to integrate back into the system and it's going to keep itself at the level you want it to. And maybe you can get it a little bit better. Maybe you can go from a hollow hold to like, I don't know, a fucking V-snaps or something, you know, but it's diminishing returns. Mm-hmm. And if mm-hmm. you've got five hours to train a week, if you've got two days to train a week because you travel a lot and you've got mm-hmm. only so much energy, do you really want to spend it getting that extra percentage or do you want to move on to something else? Have you seen, like how have you seen that play out? How have you seen it, okay, I'm at a certain point now, I don't need to touch this exercise again and you haven't had to. Is that... A lot. Really? A lot. Look, you can analogize it very, very simply. Let's say um, you get the first person walking to the gym with a complete motor moron you got to teach them how to how, how to hinge. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you, you put a little like dowel rod on their back, you put them up against the walls, so they stick your ass to the wall, they can master that. Fantastic, they've done that. That, that, that took them a day to master or a week to master maybe for the complete like idiot. Mm. So you progress them to maybe a barbell held in front of their body or a kettlebell at the chest or something like that. And that's their next progression. Do that, And they may still at that point need to go back to the dowel rod against the wall every now and then. Okay, but then eventually, when they master the weighted variation, you add more weights. Maybe you go to like a good morning or something. Do you still need to go back to that initial against the wall? Probably not. When they get to be doing like a 200 kilo good morning, do you think they ever need to go back to the wall and touch their ass against the wall again? Probably not. They probably know what they're doing. And if they can, they can do 200 kilo good morning. How much time do you really think they need to spend warming up on? a 20 kilo barbell if they can walk in and very easily do 10 reps 200 kilo good morning they might do like one set of five and then they might go to 60 then they might go to 80 they might go to whatever their progression yeah, may yeah. be but everything in life once you've reached a point of mastery of the skill and it's ingrained as that pattern always why bother revisiting there's, there's no real point to it. I mean, there could be a point if you have a bad night's sleep or you've got to repattern something or for other, other random instance. But for the most part, no. Like, do you ever go back and do a wall hip hinge? Do you ever go do um, all these basic regressions again? You probably don't need to because it's well beneath you. You might revisit every once in a while just to make sure nothing's off mm-hmm. or you may use it to troubleshoot every now and then. But for the most part, if, if you've nailed it, move on. Move on to the next thing. And the next question is, hey, okay, how much do we keep progressing that good morning for? Mm. I don't know. It depends where you want to get to. Mm. Um, and of course, there's going to be a lot of good things that happen going from barbell to maybe body weight or above. Above, But will you get a lot of benefit going from body weight to triple body weight? Probably not. Mm. There's, that, there's that U-curve or that inverted U-curve, yeah, the, yeah. Bell, the bell-shaped curve um, of, of returns yeah. where there is a sweet spot to how much you should do until it starts taking away. Right. So... A lot of the remedial, a lot of the warm-up stuff that we do, a lot of this warm-up sets that we do. Say you're doing a 300-kilo squat. Should you really spend much time doing 60 kilos of your warm-up set? 
maybe if you want to preferentially, but even those 10 reps that you do on the 60 kilos, is that really helping your 300 kilos? Not that much. But that was 10 reps, 60 kilos, that's, that's volume that you've just wasted. That's some kind of attention, some kind of ATP generation, something that you've just wasted that could have been probably skipped over. And if you started taking away, reducing, eliminating as much as you can to create the most efficient thing possible, as close as you can get towards walk-in, 200 kilo squat, <laughs> that will be ideal, but you won't ever get there, mm. unless if you're your mates who just... <laughs> did his one rep max snatches yeah. like that would maybe be like the the ideal thing that we'll never get to but how close can you get to that how much can you remove that will mean preservation of time which is kind of cool but most importantly preservation of volume preservation of fatigue the more that you can preserve that the more you can train hmm. and the more you'll be able to take that 300 kilo squat to maybe 350 because you're not so beat up from all the warm-up sets hmm. you will always need something but if you can eliminate, eliminate. And that's where that feel, thinking came from. That's what I've seen in practice with people. Say, so, hey, if you, can mar- if you can do this pike pulse and you can do 10 reps, do you really need to be able to do 100? Some people do. If you're a gymnast, probably. Sure, yeah. If you're a bodybuilder looking to just squat more, probably not. Mm. If you can do a hollow hold, do you need to be able to do a V-snap? Probably not. Depends on your sport, depends on your goal. Mm. You can do a squat. Do you need to do a, a 300 kilo squat? Probably not. But do you want to? And that's where people can choose to keep it in there if they want to, if they want to keep progressing it. But as much as I work with people, they realize they want to, they want to reduce. Yeah. They enjoy reducing because it allows them to focus. Mm. It allows them to redirect and to amplify what they really love, um, <coughs> which is what my real goal is with people. Let them do what they want to do. Let them do it more efficiently. Let them do it better. Mm. Help them unlock um, their true potential. Yeah, I think anyone that's ever trained hard for a long period of time definitely gravitates towards that idea, Mm. knowing that you can get the same results without as much training. Mm -hmm. And and anytime people prove it to themselves, I mean, we distilled it all the way down to like certain exercise not having to do it again necessarily Mm. is like a progression. But anytime you see someone (laughs) maintain a physique, a level of leanness, it's probably probably the big one I see a lot is like people stay lean with not being as rigid on their diet or not Mm. training as much. it's like a gift that you've given mm-hmm. them, right? Because you've mm-hmm. given them back the most finite resource on the planet, right? Which is our Correct. time. Correct. And I think you don't value it when you're younger. I don't think you don't value it as much when you're like 18, 21. You're just like, bro, all day train fucking, I'll do I'll do extra sets on the raw. I'll do extra fucking yeah. burpees and shit because you're just like, more is better, right? But then when you realize, fuck, my goal, right? Maybe is to be this strong or be this fit. And if I can get there with less work, now that I'm a more established human, I have more things in my life, I can now spend more time on those things and that's exciting because now you can maintain so much more by doing so much, so much less which is why I really like that which is probably what I'm going to explore because there have been certain things I've been avoiding because I'm like you know what once I get good at it I'm going to just have to do it forever and I don't want to do this exercise forever because I hate this exercise but I like the idea that I can tackle something for four six weeks or whatever to mm-hmm. the point where it's strong enough mm-hmm. And be like, cool, I don't have to worry about that again. It's now integrated into the system and mm-hmm. it's going to work really nicely. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a really cool concept that people can uh, can definitely get behind. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this happens a bit by, um, like, it's forced in CrossFit a bit, I do find. Is it because there's so many movements, people, like, have to forget about movements after a while. Right. And I find most people's experiences is if you get really good at something, you can, like, not do it for a long period of time and maintain mm. it. And it's the things that you, like, never really mastered. As soon as you stop, they disappear. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. We see it at the moment, right? Like I haven't snatched in a very long time, uh, but because you, you did it like a golf swing yeah. for just like years mm. and years mm. and years. It doesn't take long to pick Probably it like back 10, up. 15 kilos away. Yeah. And even at the end of like when I was doing a lot of weightlifting, you know, when we, when we first started, we'd start with the tens and put the tens on. And then like, no, no, no. We never, we always start with the tens and then we add the fives and we just go forever, right? Yeah. It takes so long to warm up. By the end, I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to put the 20s on. And I was like, fuck, I should always put the 20s on. The 20s is nothing. Like, I just had this weird block with it. And then I'm like, I'm going to put the greens on. I'll put the, the 20 and then the 10. Like, just fucking, like, just blow my concepts out of the water. Same result. Still strong, still snatching heavy. Mm-hmm. Still works. And it's just like, exactly. You're not as exhausted. Mm. Your thumbs aren't as worn out. Your grip's not as worn out. You're just not, like, as over it. You know, you've probably got more glycogen left in your system. There's just, like you said, more room for, for other training. 
which is yeah definitely a cool concept um invented by donny shankle what the shankle jumps that's right yeah that's shankle that's right like, you know donny shankle the lifter no no he's like a famous american lifter very famous he used to have like a thing called shankle jumps this is his name all right because he had massive jumps so all I right exactly, I, I remember when we had john north here we were like we were squatting together and we went from 120 to 170 so like we put 25s on right like, oh this is like a shankle jump he's like no this is not a shankle jump <laughs> But how can you jump more than two reds? He's like, you go, reds. oh, multiple plates. <laughs> he was like, that's not a shame. Jesus jump. Christ! Like, he, like, he looked at me in disgust. When I was <laughs> it was like, yeah, he was like, that's a shankle jump. If you're, um, if you're a pussy. Clean jerk. <laughs> Fuck, <laughs> bitch. Well, he, was, he said that for his clean jerk, uh, I think he would get there on the third set. And he wow. Was clean jerking like two hundred. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. That guy's got no time to waste. We're a very mysterious character. I um I wanted to segue a little bit um before we get to our final four questions into uh just some more maybe like fringe stuff that you do so okay. like less about the the um okay. less about the muscles and the mechanics and stuff but every now and then you'll post a photo of you doing some crazy shit preparing for the next time zones like different levels of blue light blockers <laughs> have you seen this shit it's crazy man he has like four sets of blue light blockers all with progressive different <laughs> <laughs> different levels of I only of, have of two blocking. man I only have two okay well, four is good for the story. <laughs> Um, and then you kind of like have some like kind of a strange supplement regime, which is kind of like I assume based on your hormones or, or whatever the time zone is going to be or whatever you think you might be lacking and you're looking to kind of top up or whatever. Um, how have you dealt? And I think a lot of people listening to this podcast travel quite a bit. Um, mm. We get this question, like people hit us up all the time. How do you guys maintain when you travel, et cetera, et cetera. And if anyone's the guy to ask on this sort of stuff, it's you. How do you maintain or, or what are you doing for your travels, especially when you're crossing so many time zones mm. so often uh, from like a food, nutrition, right. supplement, that kind of perspective? It's actually quite simple this when you start thinking about it from a, a circadian standpoint because what we're trying to do is optimize circadian rhythms. Now, you hear circadian rhythm, you, you typically think about sleep-wake cycles, like when you wake up in the morning, when you go to sleep. And that's one big part of your circadian rhythm, but we also have a circadian rhythm for training for when you poop, when you pee, when you hydrate yourself, when you'll be thirstier, when you won't urinate as much, when you've got more digestive function, when you're taking in nutrients, all these different things are set to a certain schedule. So like right now, um, we're all living in the same kind of time zone. We've been there for a little, for like, let's say a month at least. Our body's in a set routine. You typically wake up in the morning, you you have a coffee in the morning, you poop it around 8 a.m., you have your first meal around 9, and then you go train at 10 a.m., and then you go through your day-to-day activities, you socialize a fair bit through the day, you see some sunlight, and then in the evenings, you have a meal, and you start calming down around 5 p.m., you stop drinking fluids at around 8 p.m., that's just what you normally do, and then you're in bed by 10 p.m., and you're falling asleep until 6 a.m. the next day. That's your routine. Right. And it's when we start to get the mismatch of going through a time zone, you pull everything forward four hours. Now you're waking up four hours earlier. And then we're like, fuck, what do we do? Mm. And we only focus, like, because it's simple. We only focus on sleep and wake. And that's a small part of it. Like, we should also be looking to, those are two extremes. What about what happens in between? What about looking at what time you drink normally? So, for example, if you know that normally between 8 p.m., and 6 a.m. on your natural whatever body clock, you don't drink much fluids. If you're in a new time zone, the first thing you should try to do, even if your body clock still says, hey, I'm thirsty, if your new time zone is 8 p.m., 6 a.m. in like New York or whatever, you shouldn't be drinking then. Mm. And doing that would help to accelerate the rate at which your body starts to make those changes and recalibrate itself. Right. Does that make sense? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I thought for a second there you were... You were telling me that the opposite, that you're trying to hang on to the old times. No, 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 this is how to recalibrate. You want to recalibrate yeah, yeah. as quickly as you can. You feel like you want to drink. You'll want to, like you'll, because your, because your body will say, "Hey, right now it's it's seven a.m. in the morning in your body clock where you normally would drink something, so you so you're really thirsty." But in the new time zone, it's one a.m. where mm-hmm. you normally wouldn't drink. Mm. If you want to recalibrate faster, don't drink, even if it means going thirsty, because that discomfort is. You won't die, hopefully. Mm. Like, I'm not going to say you won't die. I'm not, I'm not a doctor. Mm. Maybe you will die. Who knows? <laughs> you're a pussy. <laughs> yeah, you're a pussy. You just take the wheel. <laughs> um, but that would help your body recalibrate faster. Mm. So on average, most of the research suggests that you can change your circadian body clock roughly an hour to two hours each day. Um, okay. If you're looking just at light entrainment. Okay. 
and waking, if you do nothing in terms of interventions, right? if you just sort of, okay, it's, it's 9 a.m. now, I'm going to go outside and hope for the best, mm. roughly one or two hours a day. If you start adding in your food schedule, your feeding schedule, your drinking schedule, your training schedule, which is another big anchor for us, if you add in maybe even things like socialization, like when you go out and socialize more, when you have interactions with people, because you're going to get, when you interact with people, what do you get? Changes in hormones. It's like Oxycontin, all these different things in the body are changing. And these are all different peripheral signals to your body to say, hey, what time of day is it? And light is, of course, the biggest one out there that's going to have the most powerful impact to our body, which is why I use the glasses. Hmm. So if I, um, let me think. So like right now, let's say it's, it's 4 p.m. If I'm going to a new time zone and actually it's not 4 p.m. in the new time zone, it's like 8 p.m. in the new time zone. Like I think I'm, I'm going to Auckland tomorrow. So I think it actually is about 8 p.m. there right now, hmm. roughly. And it's like 4 or 5 p.m. here or whatever. So... Um, it would actually be sundown over there. Yeah. So I wouldn't be exposed to much blue light. So even though right now in Melbourne or Sydney, um, it's still sun out, I should put the blue blockers on to start that recalibration process right. a little bit earlier. Because the earlier you can start it, the easier it will be. Mm. So I try to start as many of the clocks of the recalibration as quickly as I can, as early as I can. Mm. Um, so it could be a few days before. It depends what's what's most convenient. Yeah. It depends. So I might just start to pull back my drinking and feeding schedule an hour before I start traveling, maybe for a few days. Mm. Or I might train a little bit later, train a little bit later or earlier, whatever it is, to start to recalibrate that a little bit. Um, but then you can go down so many rabbit holes. It can be. It can be. A Sounds like yeah. Eating. Yeah. So it yeah. depends. Whatever. Whatever fits your lifestyle. And for some people, it may just be the blue blockers, and that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so how how much time would you need in the new time zone, like say you're traveling to Auckland, right? Yep. For for however long, to to legitimize or to get you to do whatever the recalibration stuff is. Like okay. if you're there for a day, yeah. I assume you're not gonna do much of that stuff to get ready. No. No. But how how or maybe if there's lots of time, you're like, I'm not gonna do that much because I'm gonna be there for a while and so it's all right, I'm gonna recalibrate eventually. Like how long do you need to be somewhere for you to go all in on a lot of that stuff? Um, it really depends on the, I guess, the intensity of, of of what I need to be doing when I'm in the new place. Maybe I'm in Auckland for two days. And you think, oh, what's the point? Because you're going to go there, you're going to come straight back. But I know that maybe in Auckland, I need to be there. And I need to be in a peak state mm. straight away. That's now very, very, very important. Mm. So I care about that. I'm going to do everything I can from day one to make sure I've calibrated. If I'm there for two weeks and there's no need for me to be completely on, I'll say, screw it. I'll, mm. just, I'll just hope for the best. Just rock up. I'll just, yeah. I'll just deal with it. You yeah. know? And it'll be a few days of being a little bit off and I'll be okay. And it usually would be a few days. It's usually like an hour. or It usually is that one to two hours per day yeah. that you'd be having to catch up. So you've got to catch up 12 hours. It may be... Six to twelve days to catch up. Yeah. So it depends how much how many days you want to feel like you're drunk. <laughs> but tell you how how powerful it could be. Back in August, part of my tour, I went from uh, from Melbourne to San Diego. It was uh, which is flying flying east. Yeah. Which is apparently painful as fuck, and it's about it was about twenty four hours of flying. I left ten a.m. on Wednesday morning. I arrived nine a.m. Wednesday morning. Mm. Okay. And it was flying. It was it was stopovers everything. No issue, no jet lag, no nothing. I was fine. From it's crazy. the re, I had prepared about a. Start, I started preparations about a week out. A week, a week, and it wouldn't be like a full six thing. Six hours, right? Because you did. It's like an eight-hour difference, and you see me like six days. Oh, it was nice, no, like a fourteen-hour difference. Yeah. yeah, it's quite quite big. Um, but I was like, I didn't do everything. I, I wasn't like. Up at 1 a.m. at Someone's home. Someone talking to you. Not this time. I socialize. <laughs> like, nope. Time. Stop socializing. <laughs> Get rid of those hormones, man. Go away. No. <laughs> but I was doing what I was doing whatever I could. So I would change when I would train. Okay. Or I would avoid training at certain times. Or I would avoid hydrating at certain times. I'd, I'd try fasting more, whatever it was, to um to avoid eating at certain periods. Um, and then I would be taking things like melatonin through the day. During the day. Interesting. Um, <laughs> because melatonin it doesn't it doesn't necessarily make you fall asleep right okay because signaling. because it's signaling nocturnal animals they create melatonin at night time too mm. melatonin is just there to tell your body hey it's darkness mm. it also acts as an antioxidant for all your cells in the body okay it has a lot of antioxidant um, potential within the body to clean up a lot of shit so I was taking it through the day when it was meant to be darkness 
even though it was still light outside. Yeah, yeah. I, I was like outside, sunny, like sun baking, whatever, popping some melatonin. Um, so at least my at least my cells got some kind of signal. Hey, this should be kind of yeah, whatever. Yeah, getting used to it. Um, and that all these different kinds of things were enough for me when I went to San Diego and for the whole way through my entire I my entire tour from like July through till now has been flying eastwards. It's been one big which is apparently is the worst thing you can do for jet lag. Why why is that? Uh, I think it's the direction the sun moves. Though. Yeah, well so it means you have to go to bed earlier. Yeah. It means okay. you have to go to bed earlier each time. Right, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In, the, in the sleep book, uh, we had Matthew. Oh, Matt Walker. Matt Walker. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, why we sleep? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. interesting. Because it's hard, like right now, it's like I've got to fly east to Auckland, so they're a few hours ahead. So when I get to Auckland, it's going to be 8 p.m. there, but it'll be 4 p.m. in my body clock, and I'll be like, I don't want to sleep right now, and right. which is what makes it harder for you. Right, right, right. Because whereas if you fly the other way, you'll be like, if I, if I went to Perth right now, it would be, say, 4 p.m. in Perth, my body clock would be, oh, it's 8 p.m., I'm so fucking tired or whatever. It'd be easy to fall asleep, and that would help to reset things. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, East was the worst. So I didn't get any issues all the way through this tour until I went to Ireland, and I didn't sleep for a full week because I had mold in the apartment. <laughs> that just jacked me up. You had mold in the apartment? Yeah. Like, like you could see the mold? I, I couldn't see it, but it's the only thing that would ever jack me up like that because um, I was obviously dead tired. Yeah. I was teaching. I was um, performing. I was training. I was doing everything I could, and I was, you know, taking a lot of my sleep supplementation, nothing was working. And I wasn't, I was exhausted, but I was also wired. And I know that the only thing that would have them do that to me and jack me up at night would be mold. How'd you figure that out? Um, I've had genetic testing done. Okay. And I have a few snips that make me very, very sensitive to mold. And out of all the things that I was taking, the only thing that would help me fall asleep, because I found out by the end of that, of that, of that um, stint in Ireland, was quercetin, which... Um, which is a bioflavonoid that helps suppress histamine responses, which you would get from immune activation yeah, yeah. from maybe mold or other things. Right, right. So, I mean, it, maybe it wasn't mold exactly, but I was in a very, very like 200-year-old cottage. There's probably going to be mold in there. Yeah. Um, and like I'd be dead tired through the day, like falling asleep through the day, like nodding off kind of thing. Yeah. I'd get home and I'd be jolted awake, like jerked mm. away. Okay, that's that's absurd now where you're like yeah it's yeah. that environment that new environment yeah mm, that's interesting it's so funny, apart yeah. apart from that i was completely fine the whole way through my my tour mm. um, by doing these little things mm. as much as i could as much as it could fit into your lifestyles that's what i told people to do like choose whatever map out for yourself what your circadian things are that you have control over or that you feasibly can control in your lifestyle start mini playing them as best as you can as early as you can or as early as you feasibly can mm. for your trip or during your trip and that'll make a big, big difference. Like for me, I have to, I was, I'll, I'll only be in a place for a week. So I need to make sure I'm in peak performance there Yeah. For each week. I couldn't afford to have a day off. Yeah. You know, actually some rugby teams uh, do do that now. It's funny you mention it because what they found is so like at least a lot of rugby teams fly to South Africa and it's like a crazy time mm. zone because mm. you're going directly across. And they used to fly, so if you, you finish a game on Saturday, you're playing the next Saturday. They used to fly on Monday and have like five days to get ready when they got over there. Right. Now what they do is they stay in Australia for as long as possible and they shift their time zones while they're in Australia. Right. So mm. they like start going on South African time as early as they can. Yeah. And then they go like right before. Mm. And they just turn up and they play. And, and most teams say it's better because it's actually easier when you're at home to control all the variables. For sure. For like sure. That makes sense. Sleep, that makes home, sense. Like everything's all good, but you're just like, they're training at like midnight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and then you just go and play. And it's like cheaper as well. Oh, of course they it would be. Like six days early. Yeah. As soon as they finish that game, they're like... That's interesting. Mm. Get back on city yeah. time. So, could work for like CrossFit competitions, honestly, traveling around. Fight, fighters do it a lot when they... um Even if they're in the same time zone, they just know that they're always going to fight late and they're always going to fight somewhere, especially if they're a main card. Mm. They're going to start f fighting somewhere between like 9 and 11 p.m., depending on how the rest of the card goes and lots of other stuff. Mm. So, they start shifting their entire day to that schedule they right. start doing only do their training at like 9 p.m right they don't do any training during the day they might do some stuff just some movement stuff and stuff but all the hard training happens at 9 p.m so their body is like ready to fight at 9 p.m for sure 
and they take stimulants around that time, all that sort of stuff. And obviously, then they have to go to bed at like 2 a.m. or whatever, mm. but they're way more prepared because at 9 p.m., the body's like, all right, I'm ready to fight. Whereas like, imagine if you were you go to bed early every night, 9 p.m., like over and over yeah. and over again, and then you're on the fight card and you're stepping out at 10 p.m., your body's going to want to put yeah. itself to sleep. Of course. And fighters always go, oh, like I just didn't feel right. Like I just felt mm. off. Like today wasn't mm. the day. And that, yeah, that's, that's you manufacture that yourself, yeah. essentially. And that's what I'm thinking with mm. a lot of those guys because... Mm. They know going to bed early is good, you know, waking up early is good, that sort of thing. But not if their fight starts at 9 p.m. So it's like something they don't always consider. Um, should we jump to the final four? Mm, yeah, it's been really good. Do you have any more seminars in Australia? Uh, not this year. Not this year. Uh, so it'll be probably around uh, March next year. I'll start kick off the tour again through I'll start to Australia. Yeah. People have missed out. They yeah. have. They have. Like these events, like Sydney sold out within about two weeks. So did Melbourne. Um, they sell it very, very quickly. Yeah. So you've got to be quick. And I don't really post that much about them. It's just on my Instagram. People just go, go there and say, like, oh, okay, he's coming to Australia. It's on my LinkedIn bio, hashtag. It's, it's, always, it's always on there. Um, because I don't need to. Like, I'm very fortunate where my people know where to find me and they know if they want to stay up to date, they know how to stay up to date with what I'm doing. Mm. Yeah. That's a cool place to be. So you missed out, man. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so... Uh, first question. Now, we didn't give you a chance to check these out ahead of time, which is uh, puts you at a disadvantage, but you're a smart guy, so I feel like you'll be all right. I feel like this is like something you guys do to all guests. you got this final four where you're going to fuck me up, right? Yep, okay. pretty much, which okay. is why we started sending them to a head of, like people ahead of time because they would always get like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I need more time to think about this. <laughs> oh, great. But okay. now, you know, we've okay. just, we're throwing you under the bus. So, all right. first one, easy one. We'll start it off. Uh, if you had an opportunity today to interview anyone that is alive, who would you choose <laughs> And why? And we'll give you a bit of time to think about it. But some uh, common answers that we've banned: Donald Trump, that comes up way too much. Elon Musk is banned. Elon Musk is also banned. And just to reiterate, people that are dead are banned. Yeah, yeah, because so yeah, we've had that. Don't go Plato, like. Yeah, we've had that question mis misread and misunderstood way yeah. too many times as to like, oh, but can't they be dead? I'm like, well, that's basically everyone that's ever touched this planet. Like, it's way too many people. We've actually done you a favor and made made them like, you know. We've narrowed the field down a little bit. Not everyone in humankind. But if you could have anyone yeah. that's, that's dead, Tupac, but yeah. Anyway, go on. <laughs> Just to find out, how did you die? Yeah. <laughs> Are you dead? <laughs> Who killed you? Tell me. <laughs> yeah. Look, a very easy answer that I'm probably going to fall back on because I can't think off the top of my head like this because fuck you guys, um, would be The Rock. Okay. Yeah. I'm surprised he's not on your band list. Yeah. Yeah. He's been mentioned a few times, yeah, but not enough. Just pushed him into the band. I think yeah. now. He's, <laughs> he's there now. <laughs> Actually, now that I think about it, he's bad. Yeah. Okay. Um, what makes you say The Rock? I love to read biographies. and he, oh, he has a biography? No, he does not have one. Oh, okay. I don't know. You know? I think I have read his biography. Probably not a, a legitimate Maybe one. Maybe not. Has yeah. He has like fighting stories. Okay. Or like his, his, sorry, his wrestling stories in there. Right. I thought it was a biography. I'm sure, I'm sure there is one out yeah. there, but... There's, I don't know if there's a, a legitimate one, especially over the last 10 years. Yeah, it was old. I'm, I'm, I'm really sure old. there isn't one for, for the, like the most recent what's been driving him. Mm. Um, and He's done a lot, man. Has is, he done podcasts? Like, has he done like a Joe Rogan? I don't like, think so. No. I haven't heard from him. No, no I would I love so. to hear him on Joe Rogan. And quite frankly, no one on planet Earth should interview him except for Joe Rogan. Yeah. Well, he was a bit like Arnold and then it kind of dies a bit when they actually do do the podcast. Because like Arnold has done all that stuff. Mm. Like, yeah. Had him on a know what he's going to say yeah like audio books and podcasts mm -hmm. and everything and there's not many people left like the rock that maybe haven't done yeah that stuff. Mm. yeah like i'm very curious um because he's spoken a lot just in his social media different posts about like his seven bucks and all this kind of stuff his stories that i'm quite interested in um but it'd be cool just to see the whole profile of all of it uh, or, or to hear from him because I love to read biographies on, on people to be able to uh, that's all I really read now like I don't read development kind of stuff or content or researching kind of things as much anymore um, because most of it is quite the same yeah. I'm more so going deeper into um, understanding other people's um, mindsets their motivations um, their profiles because uh, I think there's a lot to be learned from, from them and from their stories who who uh, who have you read recently? That's good. Biography. Yeah. Look, the, the one that started this whole tour for me was Kevin Hart's one. Really? About this time last year, I read Kevin Hart's book. His autobiography. Um, I tell everybody this. Um, it's called I cannot I cannot make this up. Um, it is a fantastic journey of his life. 
up until now-ish. Um, written by him, told to Neil, Neil, Neil Strauss, you know, oh, the author yeah, of the yeah, game. Yeah. So it's, it's very well written, very, very entertaining great, as well. Great author. I love yeah. his books. Yeah. Um, so you know it's going to be entertaining reader for the most part, but it makes you realize everything that he has, he, he's worked his ass off for. Mm. He's, he super deserves. And it made me have a little um, look within to, to realize I'm being very complacent. If this guy who I see is being so successful and is doing is still trying to find a way to tour for years on end and to keep going, 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 why am I stopping at four or five events this year? Or why have I not... Like, he's there... Like, I don't like to use the word hustle, but he's hustling. He's out there talking to his fans. He's um, promoting himself. He's putting himself out there. He's going where no one will go. He's going, take, going on tours where nobody else will go to because he says, there's no market there, I'll make a market there. Mm. There's no fan base there, I'll create the fan base there. He was working his ass off. I thought that was so motivating. And that's part of what put me on tour saying, hey, I've got no fan base over here in Ireland. I'm going to make one. I'll just go there and do it and hope for the best and make it happen. And that's what became this whole... 10 month thing for me and that's probably what will eventually happen next year as well I'll just keep going because now like next year I'm going to go to Italy I'm going to go into Germany Berlin, Denmark never been there before it's like okay this is I'm going to make that happen um, which is exciting and it really came from that book yeah, right. um, and also like I was reading um, Anthony Kiedis' one the oh, Red Hot Chili Scar Peppers. Tissue yeah. so good now it's I don't know. It's just him on drugs. It's just it's just a whole like it. it's just a whole book of heroin use. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> it's incredible he survived all that heroin. I am so surprised reading like the artists like him, Frushanti or Slash, how they can be so strung out in heroin yet still perform. It was inc- it's incredible. How, it is how, incredible, honestly. How can you be cohesive? Like I have two coffees and I've got the shakes and I can't <laughs> focus. Uh, I've got a little bit of anxiety. How can you be strung out on that much heroin and still string together the mastery that you do you, yeah. it must somehow let you access Jesus or something well they um, they record whole albums like I with know. just a pile of fucking rack and they it's, would just go through all of it and then quit sweet albums done yeah Drugs albums, are done, out, albums done let's keep going yeah um, but same like you would see them as a band being incredibly successful of course like yeah. especially around that Californication time now right before then you might remember from the book they were struggling. They were going on tour and it was costing them money. Yeah, massively. I was like, holy shit. Like, these are the most successful people out there and they're still having the same pain my dues. I've got to put myself out there. I've got to, got to, got to work my ass off. Like, okay, that's, what's my excuse? Mm. When I know that I have something that people need to hear. I know that I have something people need, need, to, um, need to work with that I want to get out there um, that I want to help people with. Why am I saying oh I'm a little bit too tired mm. oh I don't want to go there I don't know if people will like me there I don't know mm. if I've got the market there I don't know if I'm going to make enough money over there it's like no fuck that just go do it mm. and that's what pushed me those like mainly Kevin Hart and then the heroin <laughs> <laughs> and then my heroin use just skyrocketed shit into the into the strategy <laughs> that's, yeah. that's what I got out of Kedis' book is I need more heroin apparently um, <laughs> yeah you know I'd say um, like just along those, those same sort of lines in terms of a documentary man is uh, the Phil Knight the, the Nike story mm, Shoe Dog yeah Shoe Dog man mm. that, that thing had me like on the juice just like the creative juice for like at least a four month straight yeah mm-hmm. so um, really good book and for those people listening kind of like a business book uh, slash um, autobiography, which we um, have reviewed before, is uh, Principles by Ray Dahlia. Like the number, like I haven't. I've got that at home. I haven't read incredible. it. Incredible, incredible. It. Yeah, incredible. Um, so, second question is uh, well, it's kind of yeah. The second question is actually a little bit interesting because you've been on the road all year. But is there anything that you do consistently or have done consistently whilst on the road? Anything yep. that you feel like is essential to the success of the day? Yep. Um, to the cess of the lay, I'm not so sure. No. Yeah. Okay, there are, there are a few things that I try to anchor myself with wherever I go. I try to get some kind of nature exposure every single day. Go Does to the, the sun beach. count? Not so much. Okay. Like I get as, oh, as much immersion as possible, whether it's the ocean, it's a beach, it's at least in, in, in grass somewhere. A park. Um, a park. Um, I like the immersion of the ocean being like, no matter how cold it is, I'll be there first thing if possible. If it's not like, for me, I'm in North Sydney, it's half an hour, it's like, oh, it's a bitch to get out there. Mm. It's inconvenient, but I try to get some kind of nature exposure. That has been huge for circadian rhythm, but also for a lot of stress management um, and a lot of sleep as well. Um, and just for me, just it could just be positive, I just feel better. So I've just made that a big habit for myself. Um, 
and the days that and when I stop doing that as much for a few days in a row, I start to feel a lot of negativity, agitation, disruption to my body. Other two things that come with me all the time are a wake up light. This is part of the whole circadian thing as well, where it's a light that it's an alarm clock that gradually turns on mm. in the morning to help recreate a sunlight. So I use that, you know. Um, I guess that's more about the jet lag thing. Um, the other big thing, though, is a a water filter. Interesting. You have yeah. one of those. You're obsessed yeah. with water filters. Um, I don't know any. Th- I don't know much about filtering water or anything like that. I got sold. Th- I got sold this one by the random hippie girl in the shop. And yeah. I was like, okay, you sound like, like you said. You know, you know more than I do. I trust you, which you shouldn't, but I do. <laughs> um, so I bought it, and I thought, you know what. I'm just going to see what happens with it. So it wasn't one of those cheap Brita ones. It was like a $200 filter. Oh, apparently, okay. it takes everything out and then it remineralizes and structures the water. And I've done a tiny little bit of looking up what structured water actually is. Um, but the actual molecule of the H2O or it somehow, if you structure it, I don't really know, but it, um, it has better access to your cells. And that was interesting to me. It's hard to find a lot on it because most of the stuff you'll find online it's from other hippies yeah and I don't really take them <laughs> to their word right because they, they say a lot of other weird stuff too yeah yeah the so references are like other people yeah like which, which is yeah because you did a bunch of research right? how yeah. much was your filter man they are expensive like $200 is going to say is, is cheap and that's just that's just for a natural like jug one that you sit, yeah. sit in the kitchen yeah, like, yeah. You, can get the, like, you can get the full hardcore stuff but anyway yeah, they're like in the thousands, yeah they can easily get to the thousands like if it's in, in home kit, you like 10,000 or so they got me they, they got, got you me. both so fucking good yeah um but i noticed a lot of cool stuff and it made sense okay like if i i've got this cork here if i put it into my into my mouth and swallow it down it's in my body yeah is it actually in my body well the inside of your body is the outside of your body it's just in your stomach yeah yeah it's going to come out the other end yeah. mm. it hasn't actually come into my bloodstream it hasn't been assimilated into a cell. It's not doing anything. Mm. Even if it entered into, like, let's say you take in um, carbohydrates, like drink some glucose powder or something, into my body, into my bloodstream, has it got into a cell? Has it been assimilated into a muscle cell? Not necessarily. Mm. What if you are insulin resistant? Or what if you're a diabetic who's got no insulin production ability whatsoever? Mm. It's not in your body, mm. like not in the cell. It is in the yeah, body. Yeah. There's a big difference there. So you're still taking the same thing in, but it has a vast, vast, vastly different effect. Mm. One, for the type 1 diabetic no insulin secretion, it will kill them having the glucose. For someone who's, who's um, insulin resistant, that carbohydrate can, can be laid down as fat instead. Yeah. Or the ideal is, hey, go see your muscles, make you jacked and huge. Fantastic. Water is the same kind of thing. Anything is the same. Kind, any mineral you take is the same kind of thing. You can drink water. It can be peed straight out. It can get into your bloodstream. It's going to get into the cell. Yeah. Now, this is my N of one study, but I used to drink a shit ton of water, like six, seven liters a day. And I'd always be peeing, always be thirsty. And um, I would never, f- I'd always have like things like dry skin. When I started using that literally overnight, and I didn't expect it because I said, this girl's a fucking hippie. I don't really trust her that much, but I'll do it anyway. I don't want it to be necessarily correct or incorrect because it's inconvenient anyway. But um, dryness went away. Need to thirst went away. Need to like drink a lot more went away. Need to urinate went away significantly more. And like normally I wake up in the morning, I'm busting to go to go to the bathroom. That wasn't there. I was like, this is this is That's weird. Funny. This is very very strange for me. Uh, hydrated energy, all the other things. I'm pretty like this is this is quite strange. So since then, it comes with me everywhere. Hmm. I take that and I notice a difference if I don't have it. Have you noticed the difference like uh, that? I didn't notice everything you said, but I do notice for sure you have to drink much less water. Yeah. To get yeah. Like probably half as much. Which was significant. Like interesting. Yeah. I'm yeah. getting sold right now. Fuck. Yeah. So so let me show you yeah. this this <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you about this. The filter Eugene Tio filter, like I added this extra structure thing to it. Which is like why it's four grand. <laughs> so you just pour regular water in it? Yeah, yeah. Oh wow, that's sick. Yeah. How many liters can it do? Uh, I think it's a one liter. It's a one liter jug. Oh sorry, how many times can you go through oh, the filter before um, you need a new one? Six months. Okay, that's all right. So that's good. So, so I, I took an extra filter with me just in my in my in my suitcase as well to change it over. Um, but yeah, it's suitable. It's mm-hmm. enough. We need it for LA because LA has gross. Well, yeah, I'm just thinking yes. like LA is the place. Yeah, yeah w- we go to enough places with shitty water. Like we'll be in Dubai. The, the water's. I mean, is there water there? Where does it come from? <laughs> Who knows? You know, it's a fucking desert. That's what makes no sense. Water everywhere. So 
We need a filter for that shit, yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 And we need that shit restructured. Like, I want H2 double zero, you yeah. know, whatever that shit. I want, like, Gatorade. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think that will kill you. <laughs> H2 double zero. H2O2. Or whatever. I'll, sure I'll have you. H double two zero. Whatever that shit. <laughs> whatever, whatever I need to be, to not have to pee as much in the morning. Fuck, I'm busting. Um, third question. Definitely the hardest question. Um, what is something recently, maybe not, that you believed in for a long time that now you've changed your mind on? Maybe you preach it at your seminars, you're like this, that, and then you're like, fuck, I'm not going to talk about this anymore. I'll give you a good one that happened to us. Mm. Um, the guys at Power Athlete, that's always the one that sticks with me. They used to be a big proponent of grass-fed meat and the importance of grass-fed meat and why it's better for you, et cetera, et cetera. They had a, uh, some guy speak at their event that was like a... You're like the world expert. He's like a grass expert. Yeah, I can't remember expert. exactly what the, the name is, but basically what it meant was well, what they got out of it is like, look, I've dedicated the last 30 years of my life to researching grass, the types of grass and the effects on animals. And I can tell you with like absolute certainty that the difference between grain-fed and grass-fed meat is not a health difference, it's a taste difference. So whatever your fucking preference is, choose it because if you're choosing it for health, you're an absolute moron. And he's like, this supplement, like I don't know, fish oil or whatever it is, whatever has omega threes in it, this one tablet right here will be better than a week's worth of changing your meat over. So he's like, look, eat it for sustainability purposes or um, taste purposes. He's like, but in terms of health purposes, absolutely no difference. So small that in our studies, you can't even say that it's like a difference in reality. That supplement he talked about, was he selling that supplement? That no, one no, fish no, oil no, omega-3. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> His brand on it. <laughs> this water filter with the oil in it. <laughs> and speaking about water, <laughs> dedicated my life to that also. That was a, that was a life-changing one though for okay. us. Okay. That's, great. that's, that's big for me. Like I, I tend to avoid grain-fed. So we did as well. Because of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now explaining to that, they're like, look, because these guys, like the Power Athlete HQ, I don't know if you know these guys, they're like, they're big into this stuff. Like they're, they, they're going to push this message. This is John Wellborn, 20 years in the NFL, retired, but like big proponent, big strong dude, eats a lot of meat. Like, you know, they put, a, they, you know, if someone's going to come to them with that kind of shit, they're going to they're gonna research it. They're going to question him. They're going to call bullshit. Like they're those kind of Americans, you know, they built a ranch out in Texas. Like that's, that's serious. That's a serious shit to be talking around them. But they're like, look, we were wrong. We wow. changed our minds. Yeah, they're like, it wasn't easy. Yeah. Like we put the fucking steak in the ground that was like grass fed only beyond this point, and they're yeah. like we had to take out the steak. <laughs> yeah, they're like it was. Wow. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. Well, a couple of things spring to mind. First of all, this would be a very honestly a bland one, but I do talk about it all the time in seminars. Is like I used to teach a lot of, um, not a lot, but I used to mention the merits of stretching or of any passive work like tissue therapy, muscle body working, or whatever. Um, and the merits of it. Like, I still think it does have a place, mm -hmm. but I think it's a much, 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 probably insignificant place for most people. From cost, from time, from efficiency. Most people can completely do away with it if they know how to move properly. Is that soft tissue or stretching? Which one are you Both. 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 Yeah. Like your myotherapies, your ARTs, FST, your rub and tug, whatever you want to do. <laughs> it's <laughs> whoa, whoa. Well, okay, get rid of the rub, but maybe not the <laughs> <laughs> the tug has lots of benefits, bro. <laughs> you can't. You're true. You're right. You can't get that in training. Efficiency. Fair enough. What are you talking about? It's like two minutes. I'll take that one. I'll take that one back. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> when I go in now, I just say tug. <laughs> <laughs> he just tips at the end. Doesn't pay on the way out. <laughs> just walks in, drops twenty dollars on the table. <laughs> 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 no rub. Where do you go? I just go to a tug. <laughs> you mean a rub and tug? No, for me it's just a tug. I know the rub doesn't work. Uh, Eugene Tio told me, bro. He told me. Changed his mind on it. The rub is a waste. <laughs> oh, God. Well, <laughs> for, <laughs> we're losing our minds. Look, for actual improving quality of movements, tissue quality, um, mo all those little knots that you get, those adhesions. I've found it to be completely irrelevant. We do hit that a lot now. Yeah. Um, so it's, and it it's can, for the most part, be rectified just from a couple of quick training things. Like I showed you some of that shoulder stuff. A lot of the time, nine times, random statistic, nine times out of 10, random number, <laughs> it could be anything. All those knots people get on like the clavicular head of the pec, the scalings disappears. Literally in the course of about two minutes. 
of no touching, no pain, nothing local there. And it's all, it's all rotator cuff, subscapularis work. It's like, okay. So it's like... Exercise, strength work. Strength work. Yeah. But activation. specifically neural activation, yeah. like isometric work. Gets rid of everything. It's like, okay, well, I'll just stop going to get the tissue work done instead. Mm. Simple. Um, so that would be, I guess, the very simple answer that I that I talk a lot about in class. Because I said, even like back at the start of the year, I was teaching a lot about more of the passive... Um, palpation techniques and whatnot about how to like um, to, to, to work on certain areas but then I found it was actually not necessary mm. um, not that it's irrelevant but just that maybe if you can do a, it's like saying the hinge do you need to t- touch your butt back to a wall maybe not anymore yeah. so if we can get rid of it let's get rid of it for sure yep. um, the other part of it I guess the more um, the bigger picture to it the bigger thing that I'm start- that I'm really just starting to rethink a lot more is that there really isn't I don't, there, it really isn't a system. There really is never going to be a way. I was, I've, I've always been trying to find a way to say, hey, there must be an answer to how to move best, how to build muscle, how to do anything best. Um, like I always try to find that. But I don't... And I've had to rethink that again and again and again and again and, and see the complete opposites again and again and again, which has made me realize that, hey, there's, there's never going to be a one answer. There's going to be so many different things that we need to be looking at with the human body in so many different contexts. Mm. Which makes it again confusing but exciting, really mm. interesting. Um, and I guess an example of that is a lot of my old tech, not old, but like things I used to think about, about so much was the whole old biomechanical model of hey, you got a biceps, inserts up here, touches down there, line of pull, it's a joint, it's a lever, it pulls in, that's, and you want to overload that specific angle. And create as much stability, support, and tension in that tissue as possible to create growth. You know, that's what I would um, always talk and teach about and think about. And that's completely true. But, again, that trains one system. Yeah. That trains muscle. It doesn't train anything else. Mm. And we need to start looking at everything else. And that's where my mind goes a lot more to start to explore, um, yeah, the different movements or the different systems of mm. the body. Surely you must get some weird, weird looks like we're talking about the vibe in the gym before um, mm. and it throws you off because you are really doing some sort of training where people are just like, what the fuck is that Bruce Lee looking guy doing over there, you know? You got like the, the barbell curl where you s- looks like you're kind oh, of yeah, like... yeah, yeah, like sp- the, the unilateral yeah. curl, yeah. Yeah. Um, like we do that, we play around with that shit in here and we love it, but it's cool, like it's a good vibe in this gym, like we're kind of doing weird shit all the time, but I can imagine if you're in a globo gym, which I is pretty hardcore, uh, what kind of looks we get? getting? So I stopped really quickly. It's been like 10 <laughs> Judgment. Oh, everyone's looking at me. It's like, what? Like, yeah. it looked like I was checking if the barbell was working. Is this balanced? What's the calibration of this? That's mm. what you could say. Like, I'm just it... checking if it's balanced. There's something off here. It's going to take at least three sets of 10 to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, fortunately, I, um, I've really put a lot less thought into judgment from others. Of course. So I it's don't care way. as much. Um, and also like I've, I've had part of that process has been the support of, of my people who, who, who look at my work and they immediately try what I do and they see the benefits themselves and I think mm. okay I'm not crazy anymore mm. or also it's, it's the knowledge that hey what I'm doing with these movements it actually makes a lot of sense mm. I'm not going in there randomly and just trying to make some shit up for the gram I'm doing it for a reason and that reason makes a lot of sense to me. It makes just as much sense to me as to why I would go in and do a typical squat. So if somebody wants to judge that, it's like, okay, that's, that's completely fine. Mm. Like I, 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 I'm sort of immune to that. Um, and chances though, if they try it out after, which they usually do, that they love it too. Mm. Um, yeah. Do you have any funny stories of like when you've done something and someone's come over to you and said something? Honestly, I haven't. Damn. I, 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 like, like you think I would get a lot of yeah. weird looks through a lot of gyms, but I actually don't. I'm not sure if it's because of maybe my, my reputation in the gyms that I've been to. Where usually people do know, do know just who I am or that I'm a, a weird kind of guy. And, <laughs> and okay, leave that crazy Asian man alone with in the his corner. filtered water. And yeah, shit. with his filtered water jug and his you know blue blocking glasses and <laughs> crazy ass shit. Eating melatonin at 6 a.m. Yeah, he's chewing on these melatonin tablets and I don't know what the fuck he's doing. He's, he's snorting, he's shooting up heroin in the corner. <laughs> Let him do that. So. <laughs> with the Kevin Hart autobiography in his locker <laughs> Kevin Hart is having a target it's all good <laughs> <laughs> this guy's crazy oh. um, but no actually I, I, I don't think I, I have like the only thing I ever would get would be hey why are you doing that so come here let me show you and they'll yeah. be like whoa and, then, and it'll be that okay I want to keep doing this so, okay 
Yeah. I'm going to film you. I'm going to judge you <laughs> if <Yeah>. you do it. <laughs> yeah. I'll get you. Um, yeah, yeah. But but yeah, like people tend to curiosity, mm. curiosity. Yeah. And then and then they get, and I get excited to teach. Yeah. I get excited to be able to say, hey, come try this out with me. Yeah. And I'll show it to you. Yeah. And then I love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's obvious and is you know doesn't necessarily need to be said, but because you look good, people will also take that as like, okay, he knows what he's doing. Yeah, of course. It's yeah. also going to be at that legitimizing side of like, yeah. okay, he actually has more than a kilo of muscle on his body. Yeah. Maybe he's doing something yeah. okay. Yeah, I'm looking yeah. at his calves and I'm like, shit, whatever this guy wants me to do, I'll do it. Yeah. 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 Um, final question. You sort of did answer it. You yeah. um, It's like a book that you've read that you, that you really enjoy. Right. Let's, let's just stick with Kevin Hart. Mm-hmm. The second part of that question, part B, is, is there a quote that you really enjoy. There was a good quote on your shirt the other day. It's like the difference between, yeah, it's the Bruce Lee one. The difference between like a successful man and average man is laser like focus. Laser like focus. Yeah. yeah. Um, from that, the Kevin Hart book in particular, I don't remember any particular quote. I do have like that book is completely just bookmarked to the brim right. and highlighted with a lot of cool stuff, but I haven't gone through it because it is back What's in What's it Melbourne. called? I can't make this up. Okay. Yeah. Um, Really, really good, and it's, give it a read. it's really entertaining. Like yeah. it, it is written like through Strauss his voice. Strauss is a great, great author. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's really, it is really interesting. And there, were, there were, I do know that there were a few poignant parts, and I was like, oh, okay, I've got to make sure I remember that, and I haven't remembered that. So mm. it was quite a failure with that. <laughs> um, Sometimes you do internalize it, though, and it's hard to uh, just like pull out the actual quote. Oh, of course, yeah. of course. Like I know everything that I, that I've read or been exposed to. It's somehow influencing me yeah. back here subconsciously, mm. um, for sure. Mm. You know, it, it's in there. Um, Look, if, if there was any like quote, I guess that's the that's at the crux of the question is um, like the the way that I look at the that I look at, look at life or my approach is um, is from Bruce Lee is adapt what is useful, reject what is useless, add what is uniquely your own. I didn't really know about Bruce Lee much growing up, um, but that's honestly how I've always been evolving through my life. I've always tried to seek answers from other people. I've always tried to understand their lens, put myself in their shoes. Like another one of my favorite books, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Yeah. Um, where the whole thing is about a um, little scout. She finally goes and stands in Boo Radley's doorstep and sees the world through his shoes. It's all about trying to put yourself in other people's shoes. And I've always thought about that being a very, very important um, concept that people don't know how to do. Everybody's cutthroat. Everybody's saying, you're a fucking idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. It's like, no, put yourselves into their shoes why is that person doing CrossFit? They're not an idiot. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Little things, you know? They're one friends. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like it's put yourself in the shoes, try to understand them and then maybe reject it if you wanted to and just move on to something else. Mm. But you'll, there will always be something useful you can take from every interaction. Course, yeah. There will always be something and I always want to find what that something is because I, I find that fascinating mm. because, you know, people always have their own complete lifetime of context that I, won't, I will never have. And there'll be at least one gem in there that I can that can apply to my own knowledge or at least understand from their perspective and say, okay, I don't want everyone to do that myself. Hmm. Like I know enough about heroin from Anthony Kiedis to know that I don't want to do it. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, um, that's good. Simple as that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think the, uh, the, the main thing that I really took away from your seminar and it, it was only a brief amount of time is that like uh, you... You don't. There's no ego there, and and the thing that that stood out for me was when uh, you were you were fixing this guy. I can't remember what his name was, and he had back pain or something. And you were trying to get this exercise to work, mm, and it mm, wasn't working. Mm. Um, and you also said to him, like, I know the pressure's on you now, right now. Don't lie to me in front of everyone. Like, I want to know if it works or not. Mm. And I thought, oh, wow, that's really cool. Like, yeah, because in that situation, anyone could just. You know, even I would fall. F- even I would want to just say, "Oh yeah, it's working. Sweet. Can you like leave me alone?" Or like, "Oh, you're the man. Right. Like totally. Like yeah, my squat feels way better, man. It's totally." <laughs> thing. But you want You genuinely want to know. Like, if that didn't help, I need you to tell me. I want the truth. You know, and I, I really appreciate that. I really like that because I know how easy it is to just lie to someone and just pass it off. And then, of course. But if you're there and you're like, "All right, cool. It doesn't work." Like, you could be getting embarrassed, right? You could be like, "Oh shit, my method's not working." All these people are looking at me like, "Fuck, what do I do?" But what I appreciated was like, look. We're not getting it right now. I'm just going to stop here and we'll, we'll come back to it later. Yeah. And, and I think even the process, it's like almost like owning up to it in a way. It's like you didn't figure it out and you're just like, I'm owning it. Like I haven't got this just yet. We're going to get there eventually. But right now we're just moving on. And I really like that about you. And I think that anyone listening to this, they get a chance to do your seminar. They absolutely should. 
um, if they get a chance to, well, they can. They're going to go follow you. Uh, it's Coach Eugene Tio on yes. Instagram. Yeah. One word. Uh, I think everyone can spell that. T O is T E O. Yeah, T E O. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's probably the best place to start. But um, we'll leave it with uh, what are you, what are your plans? Like, what excites you? What's uh, on the horizon for next year? I know you're just finishing off the mm. the world tour. Mm. Um, but what do you what do you have planned? In Exciting the works? is the tour again next year for one because it ex- like honestly things like that lower back where i um, where I get stumped. I want him to tell me it doesn't work. Yeah. Because it then lets me go deeper. Mm. Then I can say, okay, maybe now I can talk about the other muscle. Mm. Or I can talk about the brain. Or I can talk about, I don't know what. Or if I still get stumped, I get to learn something new. I tell all students, I'm going to learn from you guys. The way that my courses evolve is from my trial and error. Not from the science. It's from like me playing with it and saying, oh, shit, that didn't work. How did I troubleshoot that? How did I problem solve? So I get excited to teach. That's why I love. That's why I still will keep touring as much as I physically can. And why that excites me the most, because I get to play with what I currently know and have it be completely changed by another student who I can't work out. Mm. And that'll be fun for me. Um, the other part that I'm excited about is I'm currently putting together a, a content site that will be filled with pretty much all the videos that I've been filming from our events since 2015. Of all the different, there'll people, I want people to see the journey of, hey, here's what I was teaching about stretching or whatever. Or here's where I was teaching about other modalities. Here's where I'm doing. It'll be everything that I've done um systemized of different movements different screens different teaching um spots uh different takes from all my courses so they can see a lot of what i do and get access to that because i want this knowledge out there as much as possible i want people rethinking that so that really excites me to from like the that's what's on the horizon for i guess the business or where i'm going with um that journey in terms of exploring and what else i'm excited for is um looking more into expanding the different realms of movement. Um, not like the whole movement therapies and all that. I don't even know what you call it. Edo portal stuff? The Edo portal stuff. Not that I don't like that stuff. Like I think, I think it's already been done very, very well. But mm. I want to see how can that be made even better? How can it be combined with weight training? Because I love weight training. Mm. How can it make bodybuilding better? How can it be applied from martial arts, gymnastics, whatever? All these influences. How can it... You know, I'm, I, I, the, the naive part of me... Even though I said before, I don't think it's going to be one system. I think there is a system. I think there is something to um, to engineering that physique, engineering a very robust human. If I had to put it down to anything at all at the moment, it would be exploring what the word spiral in motion really means, um, which sounds very, very hippie-ish, like I'm baked right now. Um, but... A very simple explanation would be we look at a punch from a biomechanical model and it is elbow extension, it is shoulder flexion, it is scapular protraction. But really, it's a lot of rotation. And not just a lot of rotation or the spiraling motion, but it's also a lot of other spirals through the kinetic chain down to the other leg that gets transferred through. And that could be, hi, it's all about fascia. It's all about your spiral line. It's all about that... um, lateral glute, whatever it is, that hip sling, or it's all about uh, muscle and blah, blah, blah. But the more that I look to the movements that I get the most success with, with respect to pain or muscle building and strength or feeling better or unlocking chronic issues in people, it's had some kind of rotational spiraling pattern behind it. Mm. Um, That is very much not what people are looking into. And that's part of it's a little bit what I mentioned in class yesterday why um, it is so hard for robotic engineering to be able to recreate human movements in practice mm. because they're not, it's hard to recreate the complexities of the spiral and that's all that we really know from science. We don't know how to really um, explore the rotational aspect of movement but that's where the gymnasts, that's where the dancers, that's where the martial artists, that's where the ido portals are doing a lot of very, very interesting and good things Mm. and unleashing a lot of strength. How do you create strength in the squat? It's from the active foot external rotation torque from the ground. It's not from the quads being big Mm. or the glutes being big. Um, But yeah, that's... I'm looking at playing with that as just... That's something I'm chewing on more Mm. and more. Yeah, I would love to have um, Eugene and and Julian sit in a room and just explore concepts together. But... uh, that's a that's a podcast for another day. Um, but yeah, Eugene, thanks so much for being on. It's an honor. My pleasure. Thank you My for uh, allowing us into your seminar. 
Um, we Thank appreciate you for that. coming. Yeah. Halfway through the haircut. Yeah, no um, problem. It's next time I won't, I won't make that mistake. I've got to <laughs> fix my hair. I'll only do that one. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, you'll complete the picture. Yeah. Um, you do the fringe. All right. That's great. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you, guys. It. Thank you.